Um, I'm an old broad, so I'm going to be 66 next year. Uh, but my family lives to 100 on both sides, and they work till the end. They die. So um, I still got a lot of gasoline left in me. Um, I have had a very, um, I, I'm of the generation. Um, I was born in 1953. Um, so I have been through um, civil rights protests, the Vietnam War protests. I was always or usually the only woman in a room of men, and I have worked for organizations that women traditionally have not worked for. So the boys let me on the inside, okay? So um, I've had a tremendous professional life in terms of experience, um, and I just my most important thing in my life are my three daughters, <laughs> and um, who are now way older than you all. But um, I, I have had the opportunity to run my own company for 33 years. I had 300 and 50 to 525 employees. Um, I was chairman of the National Restaurant Association in 2000. Second woman in 60 years. <laughs> okay. <Wow. laughs> they waited a while. And then I was uh, chairman of their educational foundation in 2013. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. So I've served on a lot of boards. I started on um, 1980, I started my company. In 1982, um, a group of entrepreneurs decided to start a health insurance company that was cheaper than Blue Cross Blue Shield. And uh, it wasn't too difficult because Blue Cross and Blue Shield doesn't audit their contracts. So we decided that we would audit our contracts and by doing that we would save 10%. And that little tiny organization grew to $250 million with nine employees and it, it was closed when um, the Affordable Health Care passed, but it existed over 30 years. Um, so I've had the kind of journey where um, I've just, you know, sometimes the stars all align in your life organizationally, and you work for tremendous leaders, and you just learn a lot. So really what you're seeing is not about me, it's what I have learned from tremendous CEOs. Um, now I've seen a lot of bad CEOs too, but these are what I've learned from some tremendous. So the thing that I'm going to try to explain here, you can write all the grants you want. People like me, I can walk in the front door of an organization and I can tell you if it's world class or not. I can tell by the maintenance, I can tell by the signage, I can tell by the people that greet me. So when you're experienced enough in terms of you've seen thousands of organizations, you know what the AAA ones are and you know what the ones that are just hanging on. So I just want you to understand, can you be a grant writer? Who likes to write term papers? I love term papers. If you can write term papers, you can write requests for proposals, you can write contracts, you can write grants. The tricky thing for all of you is getting to a world-class organization. And more importantly, I'm going to encourage you all, eventually, after five years of really good experience, go start your own organization. Okay? But you've got to understand, somebody's got to teach you what does world-class mean. And I was lucky. Um, I've had, I, I was lucky and blessed that I had a couple people interested enough to teach me what it meant to be world class. Because otherwise you can write grants all day long, but if the people that you're handing the money over to are not effective with the money, if they're using the money for their own personal reasons, and I have fired CEOs and I've always served on audit committees, so I've always found in organizations, for-profit, non-profit, schools, uh, I mean, we have here two years ago with fraternities, people are, if there's a stream of money, people are going to go after it. So you have to put together an organization that is world class and you understand that the dollars I'm raising for your mission are actually going to the benefit of the people you're trying to serve. Okay? And we don't really even do a good job today paying attention to that. Um, even here in Charleston there are organizations where there's nepotism, you know, million dollar contracts are being paid to CEOs for nonprofit organizations. It's just, if you just look and you study the data nationally, you'd never do what we do sometimes. So, and then I want you to get world class results. And this is not that hard, but it takes the L word, which is leadership. Okay? Okay, what's the magic here? Okay. So, what is a world class organization? Uh, the terminology that you need to learn is fiduciary duty of care. Now, think about this. It's not real simple. This is not hard stuff. A legal obligation of one party to act in the best interest of another. Where's the first fiduciary duty that you have in your lifetime? Your it's, allowance? <laughs> well, it's your parents, yeah. right? Mom and dad. I mean, we do a terrible job in America being good fiduciaries of our children. We do a terrible job. Now, this is a legal description, but forget the legal. There's tons of things you can do that are illegal in our country. I mean, you can marry off girls at 10 in most states. Okay, so forget legal. It has nothing to do with legal. We are striving for world class. 
We're striving to be leaders. We're striving to do a better job than most organizations do. But when, if I'm responsible for a, well, let's look at Goodwill. Goodwill employs 500 young people that have learning disabilities. When their parents die, many of them are going to be homeless. So I've approached Goodwill and I've said, let's set up a special needs trust for all these children so that we don't end up throwing them on the street. We know exactly what's going to happen to them. Okay? Organizationally, that's not a mission of theirs. So I have to find another organization that has that as a mission that I can help. Okay? Now, I don't get paid by any of these people, but I know this need is real and needs to be taken care of. Then you have fiduciary duty of loyalty. Now, here I put the word directors. Any organization, any organization, church, educational, government, business, needs to have a board of directors, trustees, or advisors. <coughs> when young people tell me, I want to I have my own business because I want to be the boss, I know immediately they're going to fail. <laughs> okay? Because as soon as you become the CEO, you're reporting to your customer, to your employees, to your vendors, to the bank, to the insurance company. You are not your own boss. Okay? And everybody needs a board. And when you have your fiduciary duty of loyalty is at all times to act in the best interest of the organization. All times. Okay? And it's complete loyalty and you're really watching for conflicts of interest and self-dealing. So what is self-dealing? So um, I had a CEO, one of the boards I served on, CEO of a $10 million company um, who was taking money from our nonprofit organization and using it to fly he and his girlfriend to Europe. Now nobody would call him out on it because he was the big fish at the table. But myself and another woman, you know, we were nobody, we called him out. Um, and we, unfortunately, she ended up losing her job over it, but we did get him to stop stealing money from the organization. The one thing he told me is that what? What did he hang out over my head? He goes, Denise, you are never going to be put on my board of directors. Now, how much did his board of directors make each year? Seven, sixty to seventy thousand dollars a year. That was, that's how he threatened me by not putting me on his board. So you see, if I, you know, there are organizations for good and there are organizations for bad. And one way I can hook you in, and young women, you don't usually get asked these questions. Okay, you don't. There aren't many women on boards, but young men get hooked in with what we call the golden cuffs. If you come work for me, I'll pay you $70,000 a year, but don't report on me. Right? See, that? that's conflict of interest right there. Okay? Then the prudent man rule. It's interesting to me because it's written such a long time ago. But you need to read this because you want to understand how do men of prudence, discretion, and intelligence manage their own affairs? Not in regard to speculation. <coughs> Think of 2008. Uh -huh but in regard to the permanent disposition of their funds, considering the probable income as well as the probable safety of capital to be uh, invested. Now, any organization that accepts $1 has capital to manage. Okay? So you might, be, have a, you might have the biggest heart on this earth for social work. The one thing, I, I went from the business world to social work at Meals on Wheels. The first thing I realized is that caseworkers manage it one case at a time. Caseworkers are not used to systems, they're used to government systems, but I have to tell you, the government systems that I've seen are terrible. They're not kept up to date, I mean, they won't let you touch them, and the information is horrible. So, you have to, even though you say, you know, I really want to be a social worker, you need to know enough about finance and accounting so that you can understand what those departments are supposed to look like. Um, I call out here the audit committee, because the audit committee has to work with management, internal auditors, independent auditor, and make sure that you have the proper oversight of your accounting and financial areas. It's all your money, all your assets, all your buildings, all your stuff, okay? So the audit committee, just so you know, is the most important committee on a board. The audit committee is where you find out where the theft is taking place, where the rackets are in your organization, where people are cycling off money. And I don't mean to be negative about this. How much money do you think the United States federal government has siphoned off a year? The estimates are over 32%. What? Well, yeah. I ran a business in Ohio for 33 years. 
the workers' compensation fund in the state of Ohio had not been audited for 40 years. It could not pass an audit. Right here in South Carolina, I don't know how many of you are in our pension fund here, the pension fund has been total, to terribly mismanaged, okay? So there was, what did they do? They gave contracts to their buddies. Nobody was doing oversight. And instead of getting tremendous investment results, which they should have gotten over the last 10 years, they have underperformed. So people that were planning to retire from the college in the next five years, they're a mess. I had a lady crying in my office. She was so upset. Okay? So these are, it doesn't matter what your organization is. Even fraternities. We had a $16,000 theft from a fraternity two years ago. Um, we had fraternities dealing drugs three years ago. Uh, I had one of those students in my class, and I, the next Saturday morning I got up and I saw his picture on the front of the Post and Courier. Okay? So doesn't matter what the organization is. Those are important steps for everything. Now, we're, I know you guys are anxious. I want to write a grant, but i got to get you through the stuff that really matters. Quick question. Yeah? So what's the difference between an internal auditor and an independent auditor? Oh, very good question. So an internal auditor actually works inside the company. They are checking on systems, procedures. They're, doc they're checking paperwork. They report, they can't be fired by the president or the CEO. They can only be fired by the board. So they're internal and they report to the chairman of the board. Okay? Now, if the chairman of the board is also the CEO, then it reports to the head of the audit committee. Okay? And you have to understand people that are good at stealing money, they look like the boy next door, they look real pretty in a suit, they smile. I'll tell you my favorite story of audit. So I was on this board, and we were, um, we had not had, well, we had switched auditors. Every five years now, they recommend you switch auditors. So we brought auditors in, and they looked through our employee rule list, and they said, you know, you've got an employee that's never taken a vacation in 15 years. And everybody loved this woman because she was bringing cooks and pies in every single week. And they said, you know what? This is really abnormal. She's got to go on vacation. They put her on vacation for two weeks. We hired a college intern to fill her shoes. And guess what we found? She had been taking small amounts of people's 401k contributions for 15 years. Oh. Now that woman, unfortunately, we did send to jail. Okay. Now you would have never picked her out of a lineup. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would anybody work in restaurants? Who do they always blame the theft on? They always blame it on the dishwashers. It's usually the chef. It's usually not the dishwasher. It's usually somebody else. But they're first thing, oh, the dishwasher's stealing. Okay? So these are laws that we're, have tri we've tried to develop over time to protect us. Now, Glass-Steagall Act. Okay, now some of this is going to do to <coughs> public companies. But the reality, public companies, if they're best in class, right, then shouldn't all other organizations learn what does it mean to be best in class? So we have the Great Depression, 1933, or, I mean 1929, and uh, Glass-Steagall, they analyzed what happened, and they decided that they need to separate banks from insurance companies from investment banks, okay? Now, we did that and had smooth sailing after that, okay? Now, 33 Act, limited securities because people were just basically lying about their companies and, and you know Jennifer would give me money and I would take the money and just abscond with it and then we set up the Securities and Exchange Act which helped regulate now what I want to say regulate is a bigger word than what they actually do if I want to take my company public if I want to issue stock or I want to sell bonds to build a new building what they do is I give them a document that costs about two million dollars to get produced I pay them a filing fee. So they really collect a fee. So you know how in South Carolina, if you want to put chromium-6 in the water, all you got to do is fill out a form and give it to the state? Okay? Well, that's all you have to do in most states. Well, here, all you have to do is get your prospectus prepared and pay a fee to the SEC. And if I give them a perspective full of lies, they don't audit it. They don't read it. They don't audit it. They assume that everybody that's contributed to that document is telling the truth. Then we have the Securities and Exchange Act, um, let's see, and the Investment Company Act. So these are all really with, if you're a financial planner, how do you react? How do you follow those rules? Now, um, in 1999, you have to understand what triggered this. Who knows Citibank? Okay, so Citibank, if you ever print out SEC violations, 
on Citibank, it's about this much paper. Okay, but they're one of the biggest banks in the United States. Um, they bought Traveler's Insurance, which was illegal under Glass-Steagall. $40 million of campaign contributions flowed to Washington, D.C., and 18 months later, they, uh, made, they made that act with that, that investment, and they approved it, and they took apart the Glass-Steagall Act. So those of you that follow Bernie Sanders, Bernie says we need Glass-Steagall back. He's absolutely right. There are five banks in the United States today that control over 71% of the wealth. Five banks. Okay? So we've done nothing but concentrate power. This was bad, what we did. So it took a few years. didn't take that many years. took, what, nine years. And then we had the implosion of companies like Enron. So uh, we had Lehman. Now, Lehman Brothers only imploded because of Goldman Sachs. Okay, but let's talk about Enron. So Enron, I believe, had 29,000 employees. They made everybody put Enron stock in their 401k. Um, it was really a flim-flam of an organization. All 29,000 people lost their 401ks. They had a whistleblower that came forward. Um, one of our senators, whose name I'm going to forget right now, um, Senator Graham, actually was the head of the audit committee, and his wife, Wendy, was on the audit committee. Now, personally, if I ran the SEC, I'd have Senator Graham and Wendy both in jail. I guess they are in jail. They're in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> so... So what the Sarbanes, and uh, Mr. Mr. Oxley just died last year, which is unfortunate, but what this act did, it says, Rizzo, if you put out an income statement and a balance sheet, you're going to have to sign your name to it, and if you're lying on it, you're going to jail. That's basically what it said. It also says you have to have internal audit in an organization. You have to be checking, okay? Um, so, and then the other thing that it says is basically that you have to change your auditor every five years. What happened with Enron is that Arthur Anderson of Houston was taking over a million dollars a year out of Enron in fees. So the more I pay you in fees, are you going to look under the sheets? No, everything looks great. Okay, so those people literally just walked out the door with nothing. And then we have the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection. Let me tell you, there is no consumer protection. Okay, this was a sham, and I hate it to say it, there is no law, there's no usury laws left in the United States. Do you guys know what usury means? Uh, interest? Charging interest? Yeah. So in the old days, when the dinosaurs roamed, roamed the earth, they could only charge you like 10% of 10 percentage points above prime. Okay? There's no usury. So I'm a I'm an older woman. I listen to Mot a Motown station online, and they're always advertising these new banks. You know, get the money as fast as you want. Just contact us. So I've been researching. There are interest rates as high as 200%. I found one. It's a non-regulated bank, 700%. Can you ever pay back a $1,000 loan at 700% interest a year? Oh, on top of that, fees. On top of that, penalties. Okay? So this, now, none of this has to do with a nonprofit. But the first thing I ask anybody that asks me to serve on a nonprofit is I say, do you follow the guidance of Sarbanes-Oxley? Do you reach to be this good of an organization? Because if you don't reach to be this good of an organization, I know I don't want to be on your team. Okay? Investment banks. Investment banks work with businesses and organizations, right? Governments. Insurance companies take your deposits and they don't pay out that money for another 30, 40 years, right? right. And banks take your deposits specifically for to develop, it's supposed to be for community development. Okay? That's why our communities are struggling, because now the assets in our in our country are in five banks and they're not located across right. the country. Okay? Now so there's a thing called the business roundtable, and the business roundtable, so you, if you listen to financial news, they're always saying, they're always talking about how much money they've returned to stockholders, right? Stockholders this, stockholders that. Well, this year in 2018, of uh, the money that has, the, uh, what do they say, the income that's been generated in 2018, 82% of that money went to 1% of our population. Is the model broken? The model is really broken. 
Okay? So in theory, this organization says, well, this is how you're supposed to run an organization. The interesting thing to me, they don't talk about the customer until number nine, which I found, I was always raised old-fashioned. Your customer is always number one. And who's your customer? Your customer that pays, or the customer that you service, your employees, your vendors, and your community, okay? And then if you stretch that to the environmental common law, who is community, right? Well, it's the environment, it's humanity, and it's, uh, it's economy, right? They put economy first. Screw everybody to make a dollar. They don't care. I mean, like you guys with Facebook, how anybody can trust Facebook is beyond me. I hate to say it, because this is a Google Doc, Google has a thousand times more information on you than Facebook does. Oh, and you know those insurance companies I was talking about? Well, guess what? They not only look at your age and your health and your income, they verify all your behavior on your Facebook. That big data that they talk about is really going to destroy. I mean, there, is, there should be no trust with these organizations because they've got more information on you and it's only going to cost you more. So, what we talked about board of directors, right? The board of directors, board of advisors, board of trustees. Usually nonprofits will have boards of trustees, especially on their, their mission work. And on their business work, it's usually a board of directors. And if you're just starting a small company, you don't have to have legal relationships with these two people. You can just have advisors. We talk about senior management. I'm going to show you a picture of senior management. Usually in organizations, it's the top five guys. And what do we talk about in business? How do we enrich the top five guys? So what did the new CEO of Verizon do two years ago? I think they're paying him $20 million a year. The first words out of his mouth were, how do I get rid of health insurance on my 40,000 employees? See, those are the kind of people we pick, OK? Um, so what I want you to do, responsibility of management with board oversight is to operate the corporation in an effective and ethical manner to produce long-term value for shareholders. I want you to edit that. It's stakeholders, customers, employees, vendors, community, environment, humanity, and the world. We just can't worry about the shareholders. Okay, the responsibility of having the right and privilege to run an organization is much more than about your shareholders. And if it's a nonprofit, it's much more than about your donors. Okay, um, we're gonna talk about strategic plan. One of the, yes? Oh, I was curious, is that part of what like, the corporations strive to do? I do yeah, they do down here. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, I think there's only, there's only like two certified here. Yeah, yeah, Carolina. I did it. <laughs> yeah. Last it, I heard there was yes. none. Like, I think well, I think, yeah, last, well, yeah, that's so exactly did, right. But, but you could, yeah, yeah I, it's a start. Yeah, it is a start. So, yeah. strategic plan. The one thing I see with not only, not only businesses, but more, more, most likely with nonprofit uh, organizations, and you can ask your government, you know, if you live in Mount Pleasant, ask to see their strategic plan. If you live in West Ashley, if you're on a school board, mm -hmm. is most organizations are very bad at strategic planning. And strategic planning is looking out one to three years and actually writing down what you're going to accomplish, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. And um, I, I was trying to help a woman in New York with, she had a very good nonprofit organization. She was bringing technology to inner city youth 20 years ago. And I sat down, and she was in her 70s, and I said, you know, we've got to do some succession planning. You're not going to be here forever. And I sat down with her in a meeting. I said, could you show me your strategic plan? Her strategic plan was 10 years old. Okay? <laughs> so you only have, you have a responsibility when you run an organization to update that plan every year. Okay? You're going to update it every year. Through the audit committee, you're going to stay involved with protecting the assets of a net nonprofit organization did not have a succession plan. So here's her husband without a wife, her son without a mother, and a nonprofit organization that folded. It did not have a leader plan. There was no other leaders in the organization. Nothing was written down. There were no systems to support the good work they were doing. So succession planning is important, okay? Um, we're going to talk about that. And again, compensation. I, I get a little bit upset about this. Does the College of Charleston have a good compensation strategy? Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, in the business school, we lose people constantly. From what I've heard, I mean, it's yeah. far from yeah, what I mean, it should be. Well, I'm sorry? I said, from what I've heard, it's far from what it should be. Oh, my God. I, if I'm, especially, I'm, especially between the adjunct and, and the, um, uh, the professor. Yeah, and I mean, uh, absolutely. sometimes I'm hearing 100% lower than what are paid at other schools. 
So what does that tell you strategically about the organization? You want to work for an organization that values their human capital, right? And compensation planning, and that does not mean every once in a while the boss gives you a raise, or every once in a while the boss throws 100 bucks at you at Christmas. That's not compensation strategy. It's not compensation planning. Okay? And, and it really makes me crazy because um, I do apologize. I was chairman of the National Restaurant Association. This idea of paying people minimum wage for 20, 30 years, it's, it doesn't work. All the homeless people I deal with have worked all their life. Okay? So we have to have wages and salaries with health insurance, with life insurance with a retirement plan, with an annuity, with long-term care. That's what we need to have, okay? So all of this relates, again, it's not just for business. It's for all nonprofits. It, I mean, it's for all organizations. So I just want you to think about that. Okay. Now, this is what the top, I always call it the top five guys, because most organizations, and I want to tell my two men in the room, I love you already. Okay, but I have spent my whole life working with all men. They don't let the women in. I was short, chubby, and ethnic, and I snuck through the door. Okay, but they didn't let anybody in behind me. So, okay, exactly. So, this is the chief executive officer. In an organization, the chief executive officer looks out today for five years. Okay, so here's me looking out five years. And then right behind me, back to back, is the chief operations officer handling the service or product over the next... 30 days, okay? So there's tension between those two rules, right? Those two, are, those two roles. So in my simple brain in the business school, your human resources officer is critical if you want to grow a real organization, okay? Um, and on top of that, you don't have to hire that person full time if you're starting with a small organization. There's plenty of Really good HR directors you can hire just for a few hours, but they will help. And I'll tell you, I was on a board in 1990. We grew from a billion dollars to 40 billion dollars by a, we called acquiring Russian banks. And what were Russian banks? Those were banks around the Great Lakes that had no product inside the bank branches, and the guys were always golfing. That's what we looked for. If we knew the CEO was a golfer and they spent the summer golfing, we went to buy that bank. So we bought 14 banks in three years, grew from a billion to 40 billion. We only could do that because we had a phenomenal HR director who could go out and find his talent. Okay, now he hired, oh God, probably 300 people, and we tested them for three days. Okay, all kinds of psychological performance testing. We still ended up with six fraternity lawsuits. And we spent three days testing every single person we hired, okay? So as good as they are, you still might not be 100% perfect. Each suit costs us $250,000, okay? And these men that were in these fraternity suits were all making $250,000 plus. Then you need a chief marketing officer to build brand. So what is your favorite brand? Jennifer, what's your favorite brand? Uh, oh. Who has a favorite brand? <laughs> I, I, yeah. Got a brand? Do you like to have a brand? Nike? Yeah. Okay. Then we have a Nike lecture, I think, next Monday. Yeah. Okay. So his brand is Nike. Well, somebody has to keep, somebody has to, like, you guys know Meals on Wheels. You know that brand. But you don't know Charleston Area Senior Citizens Services. But you know Meals on Wheels, right? So Meals on Wheels has national brand identification. Charleston Senior Center doesn't have identification even locally much. Okay, so that's what you want, that's building brand. Your chief operations officer's got to be systems oriented because the only way you can deliver consistently is great people with good systems supporting them. Okay, you got to have both. And then you have a chief financial officer, which does your finance, your audit, and your IT. However, in some organizations, they put the HR director under finance. I don't ever think that's a good idea because this guy's trying to pinch every penny. And in, in compensation strategy, you don't necessarily want to pinch every penny. Okay, does that make sense? So every organization, you want to start an organization. Now sometimes when you start a new business, you may have to serve in three of those roles, right? But that's okay, those are the functional areas. Okay, so 64% of small businesses in the United States do not follow this. Now, I don't understand why we don't just establish what great business practices are. 
So most organizations do not do this. <coughs> Is your board comprised of board members with time, talent, and treasury to achieve your strategic mission? With nonprofits, they never have strong people on their board. They have people, I mean, you, and you can have two kinds of boards. You can have your board of trustees, and then you can have an advisory board. Okay, you don't have to have all, the t all on one. But if your board can't help you grow over the next three years, then they're not effective. They're the coaches. They're the mentors. Now, the Jewish uh, community is extremely good at this. That's one of the reasons I know so much about it. But the Jewish community is very good about, in fact, the oldest company in America is in New York City. It's seven, seven generations old. And they coach. So the oldest living member, who's in his 90s, still sits on the board and coaches the 20-year-old that they're trying to coach to run this organization. Okay? So that, and TRW, which doesn't exist anymore, um, that company, which is a, was a global company, they have the same philosophy. The oldest living member of that board, the oldest living member of, that was an officer, still sat on the board to coach the new guys coming in. And I hope it's new men and women coming in. Okay, does your CEO report to a board? If you go to work for an organization and there's no board, go somewhere else. Does your organization have a three to five year written strategic plan? Updated annually. So if you're going to meet with somebody, oh, we want you to meet the CEO. Aren't you excited you're going to go to the corner office? You go to the corner office, ask the guy, do you have a written strategic plan I could look at? And if he says no, go next door. Does your organization have a certified human resource director? Now, I want you all to write this down and go online and look on this. The Society of Human Resource Management is one of the best organizations, professional organizations in the United States. If I wasn't involved with the National Restaurant Association, I would get involved with them. All of you should go for your certification in human resources. Why? I want to be a grant writer. Well, you can't build an organization unless somebody knows human resources. Okay? And you can get a certification. They have a student membership. I only um, hired, when I started hiring human resource directors, I only hired people that were part of this national organization and went to at least one meeting annually because I knew they were lifelong learners, okay? Now, with the robots coming, and they're coming fast, guys, and I hate to say this, um, uh, I, worked, I was on the board with the man that was human resources director for Kodak when Kodak had 60,000 employees. Does anybody know what Kodak has today? No, now they have about 2,000. And it almost killed him because he was an HR director but he had to downsize that organization. I mean, I'm surprised it didn't kill him. But that's what HR, it'll help you grow, and then sometimes if you gotta downsize, it'll do the same. Do you have a full financial audit? This is why my company's out of business. I did not know that my husband and my executive chef were stealing money, even though they both worked there 32 years. I didn't know. But they would never let me have a full financial audit. We only did reviews. So if you don't have a full financial audit, then you really don't know what's going on in the organization. And then, do you have a funded buy-sell agreement? Does anybody's mom or dad have a business? What's the company? Um, it's a small gas station up in York, South Carolina. Okay, so if uh, mom and dad own it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if something happens to mom and dad, if there's not somebody else lined up to take over that business with the funded buy-sell agreement, then the family loses everything, okay? So a funded by sell agreement means I own a company and I'm 65 and I wanna retire. I find Jennifer at the College of Charleston who wants to be, she's interested in my business and I invite her to come work for me for five years. I find that she's outstanding. So I said, you know what, Jennifer? <laughs> We're gonna pay an insurance policy for $2 million so that if, when I die, my family will get the $2 million and you'll get the business. That's a funded by sell agreement, okay? That same concept can work in nonprofit organizations, any organization. That's how you protect families, okay? What's the worst thing you can do? Pass the business on to your children. Your children don't want your business. It was not their dream. Yes? So how would that work at a nonprofit, this by sell agreement? Well, what you could do um, with a nonprofit organization, uh, like we're going into a recession in the next three to four years. You can reach out to other nonprofit organizations and say, I would like your organization, if we, hit the, if we hit the bumps and our organization doesn't sustain, we'll pay for a policy for you to buy the organization. 
Same, okay, as opposed to with a person, you do it organizationally. Isn't that, though, uh, part of your 501c3 paperwork? You have to identify a, a nonprofit in that paperwork that potentially your assets can go to? Except it's not funded. So what, what, if, what, if it's, what if your nonprofit's a mess? I don't want to take it over. There's no rule saying they have to take you. Sure. Yeah. So that yeah, that's how you could do it. You could do it. And then the other thing is um, a key person agreement. So if you have someone that has worked for you a long time, okay, that is not going to be ownership, but maybe this guy's worked for you for 30 years and he is critical to the company, you could say, you know what, Jennifer, when you turn 65, when you decide to retire, if you want to retire, uh, I'm going to fund an agreement for you. A uh, life insurance agreement. Oh, the other thing I could do, I'm going to set up an annuity since you really don't have a pension plan. Because I care about you as an employee. Okay? So there are financial tools out there, we don't teach many people about them, that you can do to help protect the people in the organization and the organization. And then does your organization have a development director and a team? If you don't have this, this is a very big red flag if you're a nonprofit. How can you be a nonprofit? I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more. Okay, now, I just want you to know, the Great Recession took down a lot of charities, okay? And um, this just, and, and who were the ones that failed? They were people that had revenues of less than $100,000, okay? Um, so basically, you have 22 to 30% of people that earn that much money, they just close their doors. And it's sad because a lot of these nonprofits, a lot of the tiny ones do really good community work, but not enough to sustain, okay? We're coming up to another one. If we're not prepared with our buckets properly, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make it. So that actually is a research you could read. Okay, now, two things. Um, mission and value statement. So you need to write out what your mission is. Now I work at the Senior Center. Our mission is enhancing the lives of seniors in the community one life at a time. Um, it's okay if you really look into the history of the organization. It was started by Nicholas J. Satilli. You guys recognize that name, right? Um, and Mr. Satilli studied for three years for the city of Charleston, condition of seniors, and it's no different than what it is today. Lots of homeless seniors, lots of seniors with no food. Um, back then they didn't use medicine that much. Our seniors are trying to decide, do they buy food, do they buy medicine, or do they pay their utilities? So they're their decisions. So you have to write, what I would write is that our strategic mission would be um, that no, no senior should ever be homeless, without food, without transportation, without company. I mean, that's what I would write, because that's the specifics of what we do. And if I shared that with anybody, they would know what I'm talking about, okay? Now, I want you to go to this site on your own, I'm not going to click through because I'm taking too long. Steve Pavlina. He has a list of 418 values. I make my students, this is what I do. I make my students go through the 418 values, pick five, and write one paragraph on each. Now, I do this the first week of school. So when I ask them, did you, read the, did, did you get the textbook and did you read the first chapter? And they say, oh yeah, professor, I did. And then they give me their values, and their values say, one of their values is honesty and they flunked the first test. I said, how did this happen? You told me your value was honesty. Okay, so people have values, organizations have values, and you need to know up front what is your mission statement and what are your values. So he's got 418, it's a great list. Um, I, it's very helpful also for coaching students, I find. Okay, then leadership, the L word. Okay, now, uh, KPMG, which is not one of my favorite accounting firms, I'm saying right up front, they've done a lot of stuff I'm not so excited about. However, they talk about the three, there's three traits that they talk about. Compassion is one of those traits. Now, I, I challenge my students to write about the most important leader that have, has influenced them in their life without talking about money. Because normally they tell me, oh, Mr. Smith down the street made $40 million, he's my favorite leader. I said, what else did Mr. No, Smith do? Okay, I'm in the business school. Okay. Somebody else we all know. Yeah. So compassion. So you have you have a greater sense of personal security. If you have a greater sense of personal security, you can work to solve problems for other people, organizations, whatever you're doing. 
Okay, so compassionate one. Curiosity. This is a big one. Um, creativity. Unfortunately, one of the things the world has done <coughs> is they've made us all technicians. Mm -hmm. You're all specialists. Okay, you have to major in one thing. And I'm still sort of of the liberal arts. I believe you need to, if you're going to especially run any kind of organization, you need to know a lot about a lot of different things. So what they say in some of the courses, that you know what you know. You know the stuff you know. You know 2 plus 2 is 4. Okay, and you know what you don't know. Okay? You know that you don't know a specific math equation. Okay? You don't know sometimes what you know. Your kid gets squished by a vehicle and you're strong enough to lift it up. You didn't know you could do that, but you did it. Okay? But in any organization where most of the opportunity lies is what you don't know, you don't know. And the only way you don't know what you don't know is by talking to your customers, your employees, your vendors in the community and being curious. I have a simple rule. If the phone rings three times and three different customers ask me to do something that my company doesn't do, I try to do it. So this week at my nonprofit organization, where I'm a very low person in that organization, one of the managers told me, we get calls every single day for this. And I went to my boss, I said, you know, we're getting calls every single day for this type of help. Why aren't we providing it? And I got, I got financial responses. Well, the insurance is too expensive and we can't pay enough. And, I said, you know what, I'm going to take this need and take it to a foundation that can't fund it and run it. Okay, so you have to want to keep learning. And that's the one blessed thing about me working here. They're willing to trade and train and old broad. And I keep learning and, and it helps me solve problems and I'll be able to do more. Courage. Courage is the capacity to do the right thing. This is tough. Whistleblowers in the United States, only 20% of them are successful. Only 20%. So if you uncover theft in an organization, who's coming after you? All the people that were profiting from the theft. They're not going to protect you. So this is really, really, my values are very strong. I'm very ethical. Even though I worked for Goldman Sachs and I saw a lot of bad stuff, and I thank God every day I was protected. I've got great stories, though. Okay, I'm very self-critical. I always think I fail everything. And I'm, I'm not good at letting go and moving on, but I'm very good at resilience. I got hit by a van in March. I should have died. But here I am. Okay? I'm a tough old broad. I've always worked with men. I've always worked on boards. The men are always 6'2 or taller. I just, just met a new president of a hospital in Memphis. He's a College of Charleston graduate. He's one of our basketball players. I've never had a meeting with a seven-foot-tall man. The whole time I was like this. Okay? So courage, I think I'm as big and bad as LeBron James. And that is how I've always worked. I don't care. Because what do, now I love you two guys, so don't get mad at me. What do men always tell women? No, you can't do that. That's not a good question. Why did you even bring that up? I don't say that. You don't say that because you're not at my board meetings. But that's why I'm telling you guys I love you up front. Okay? We laugh. What happens in the board meeting? If you're the only woman in the board meeting, you bring up an idea. The chairman says no. Ten minutes later, the guy next to him brings up the same idea, and it gets approved. Okay? I get calls on that from other ladies that still serve on boards. So courage is very important. Now, there's a few other things that I've been taught that are also important. You need to have strategic vision, and I'm going to go through this again and again. You can have a strategic vision for you, okay? You need it for every organization. You've got to be able to make tough decisions, okay? I once had to fire my brother-in-law. I caught him stealing. I mean, I wasn't going to let him stay once we caught him stealing, right? Um, you have to cut the dead wood. That's why I don't recommend you hire friends and relatives. And you've got to fire somebody that can't do the job, and it's a relative... You've just destroyed that relationship. And you have to be able to listen. The L word, this is the other L word. If you can develop a sense of hearing, of listening, um, it's a, again, you're paying attention to the customer who pays or receives your service or your employees and your vendors. 
If you like to read this stuff, Jim Collins has written a great book about running organizations called Good to Great, and I highly recommend it. Now, do not get mad at me. This is Harvard Business School article. <laughs> I've been burning my bra since 1968. Two and a half to 4% of leaders in our country are men. And I'm sick of it. So a lady that I know who's very successful, she sent me this article. So to the young women in the room, to everybody in the room, you all can be the leader. Even if you don't have the high D dominant skill, you can bring that skill in. But we have... Things are really screwed up. I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with college students in the morning and homeless seniors in the afternoon. I walk two blocks for this world to change, okay? You all can do something, and we really all have to start doing something, okay? And I, whether you're religious or not, that one, that one statement about loving thy neighbor, we do a terrible job of loving our neighbor. The homeless people will tell you, nobody says hello to me when they walk by. They're, they're sickened when they see me. And what do you say when you ask a student? They say, oh, homeless people have never worked. Well, these people have, I have, I've had a guy that was a $100,000 a year guy in Chicago. He's homeless. I've had nurses who are homeless. I have another nurse from Seattle who's about to become homeless. The guy yesterday worked for Ford and for GM and for the city state of Michigan. Okay? The way we have set up finances is not right. So I'm encouraging you all. And don't go to work in an organization where there's not a good leader. And most organizations don't have good leaders. So that's what I'm trying to encourage you there. Okay, so four tools for building team. And I know I'm running long, so I won't go into everyone. I'm going to go into this a little bit. One of them is a DISC personality test. I have been using this for over 30 years. Okay, it's to understand someone's dominance, their interpersonal communications, their steadiness, which is working like a robot, and their, their compliance, and that's critical thinking. Any artists in the room? Any musicians? Okay, well guess what? That's a high C. Accountants, high C. So that's a way to understand how you can build. Do you want to hire people just like you? No. If I hired people like me, I'd make the whole organization insane. Right? <laughs> I would. Okay, I gotta build a baseball team. Every plate's gotta have a different skill set. Okay, then I want to also, this is the A score. In Charleston, we are blessed to have darkness to light. If you don't know that nonprofit organization, highly recommend you go for training, it's free. Um, this is really sad to say about America, but this is the lack of fiduciary care for children and families. Only 33% of American children get to the age 18 without trauma, okay, which means neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse, alcoholism, drug it. I mean, I, I can't tell you, one of the toughest homeless interviews I did a few months ago was a 20-year-old boy whose mother and father were both addicted to crack. And he was a heroin addict from the time he was 16 till 20, till a bullet, and, he, and it was funny, he lifts up his shirt, shows me this hole, you see this bullet, it missed my heart, and it missed my lungs, and it missed my spine, and that's the only reason he stopped, because he grew up in a world, or they can be abusers, or the abused, you don't know who's in your organization, so this is a very, it's a great, darkness to light is wonderful, I recommend you go for training, and, and use their forms, and then op open psychometrics is wonderful, it's called the dark triad, um, this is what I was married to, a psychopath. And um, I didn't know, okay? So this measures, I'm going to go in another, another form. This measures um, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy, okay? This is a very easy test. I have given it to some of my finance 303 students in the past. And I had a Marine that was a, uh, that rated very high on that score. It was scary because I turned him in for cheating. You know, I didn't, I had turned him in first. And then I gave everybody in the class this exam. So this is a good one. And then we're, we are using this at the college, the Gallup's Strength uh, Finder. Now, I, I've been going for training for two years on the Gallup Strength Finder. I love the concept, but there's 34 variables. It's harder for me to manage. It's like, it's like a long regression analysis for people, and it's a little hard. So you focus on the top five, and we do have a faculty committee that uh, we do try to use this, but again, I find the disc. I've used the disc on about 3,000 people. So let me just update you with this. So this actually goes back to the four elements of earth, uh, water, air, and fire. And, and for me at my age, what group am I thinking of? Earth, wind, and fire. Okay, so, and actually, Hi Hippocrates actually 
took this concept and actually started writing about it, but they were a little bit off. They thought it had to do with the fluids in our system. Right. But it's not about our fluids, okay? It's, it's sort of our physicality, our strengths from the, um, uh, you know, from, from Earth. So Young, am I saying that right? He actually started writing about this in 1900, and he called it sensing, intuitive feeling and thinking. And then William Marston, who actually was at Harvard, he wrote a book called The Emotions of Normal People, Dominance, Influence, Steadiness, and Compliance. And what Gallup did is it's taken this research, which has been going on for a long time, and they've expanded it for the, uh, to this 34 variables, which is, for me, harder to manage. So this is the, now, so if you tell me i got to hire somebody, if you hire them without giving them this test, shame on you. This will, this will help you hire the right people for the right job. It's very simple. I'm going to show you that. Okay, so there's two styles. So when you are relaxed at home, you're on this side of the chart, okay? So this is a natural style. You're relaxed. And what this says is your dominance is, it's about mid. Your interactiveness, this means you talk to people in your house. You run the house a little bit, you're interactive. Look at this, you're steady. Now, this is very interesting. People that fix their bed every morning, their, their S is way up here. I ask every student this question. And unless their S is at the top of the chart, they have not fixed their bed. This is critical thinking. So at home, this means maybe you paint, maybe you cook, maybe you garden, maybe you work with tools, maybe you fix cars, maybe you play the guitar at home. That's compliance, deep thinking. Now, you're at work, and it's stressful because you got a boss. Okay, so this is the adaptive style. Um, and I recommend you all go do this. Um, this is dominance, okay? Now, if you're going to run an organization, you're going to have a high D and usually a high C. High Ds and high Cs are people that run departments, run organizations. If you're going to be in sales, you're going to have a high I, and hopefully a high S. If you have a high I and a high S, you're actually going to turn in your paperwork. How many of you have students that don't turn in homework? Well, they don't have any S. And I've been trying to tell Michelle Fattrell, let me give this test to all freshmen. All the people that have no S, I end up flunking, and then I work with them through the next quarter to get them passed. Okay, I mean, it's just, it's so predictive. This is compliance. So, who has a PhD? Do I have a few PhDs in the room? Nobody else? Okay. Typically, PhDs and engineers, I never saw this until I came to college, came to College of Charleston, the S and the C is very high. Now, I'm going to say, Ashley, you have some I because you're pretty interactive. I, have, I know PhDs on campus, they don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> Leave me in my office, I have research to do and a paper to write. That's a high S, C. Okay? So engineers are the same way. Do engineers or computer programs, do they want to talk to people? Do they want to take charge of the organization around the world? No. Okay? So whatever you have, it's all good. It's just hire the people you need that complement this. Okay? That is, that is the, this, this tool is the greatest tool on earth. But I, and I work in an organization that refuses to use it. So what happens with their turnover? It's very high. How do you keep hiring the wrong people? This is the adverse childhood experience, darkness to light. Um, this is very interesting, their history, and I forget how far back this goes. Um, 30 years maybe? Um, there was a doctor in California that was running a weight loss clinic. He was dyslexic, and he asked a question that he was required by the state to ask, and he asked it wrong. So he's running a weight loss clinic, and he asked the question. I forget how he was supposed to ask it, but he basically asked, how old were you the first time you had sex? And the women were saying eight, six, and he thought something was wrong with him. He then met a colleague at a conference, and that colleague mentioned, you know, I have all these women that are very obese telling me that they had sex when they were really young. So these two doctors came together and started doing research on it. And this is what I learned, and this is what, this is what it looks like. So basically, you're either, children in our country, 67% of them are dealing with some of this. I just interviewed a man this week, very crabby homeless man, smart hard working. He shared with me, <coughs> you know, when I was in Michigan, I was 15 and I was hitchhiking, and I get in this car, he goes, you know what the man did, he raped me. He goes, it affected my entire life. 
Their research shows that whether you were sexually abused, your dad hit you, mom and dad were alcoholics, whatever the issue is, this impacts your DNA, it impacts as your synapses, it impacts your medical health, you will not live as long as everybody else, your medical bills are going to be higher. The research that these two guys started has been amazing. So you cannot hire somebody and not pay attention to what's going on in their life. I call it, like when I deal with a student, to me a student's like an A. I need to know how scrambled up it is inside. I had a class last semester where 60% of my students were divorced. I had a class before that where two students had relative, friends commit suicide because of drugs. Those kids aren't going to perform like everybody else. They need help. And you can't give service to people unless you understand what you're dealing with. Most of what this research has said is these people just need to know it's okay to talk about it. It's a little bit of what we're seeing with the Me Too movement. I don't know if you guys watch Don Lemon. Go online and watch. Don Lemon was sexually abused. Go online and watch that segment. You will cry through the whole segment. He was 37 before he was able to talk about it. So, but this is what you're dealing with, okay? I know you, I have a, had a student tell me, my mom thinks I'm an alcoholic already. What do I do with that information? I go to the FAST form. I say, I need some help. I had a student whose mom died, and he came out and told his dad he was gay at the funeral. What did his dad do? Stop paying his tuition. So he's homeless for six months in Columbia. How do I help him? Okay, we're teachers, we're mentors, we're coaches. We need to understand what's happening with our students. And I'm going to tell you, I sort of grew up when moms and dads sort of stayed together. The marriages might have sucked, but they stayed together, okay? You didn't have to starve. There's 127 homeless children right now in the, college, in, in the city public schools. And last year they ended with almost 500 homeless students, okay? So a lot of that has to do with this. And you just have to understand how you can help. So I'm talking about running a great organization. This is organizational behavior. So I've, I've talked about it. My first job, not my first job, I started working at nine, but when I worked for BP, which bought Standard Oil of Ohio, um, I had a, the head of human resources was actually a Lebanon PhD, brilliant man. I don't know why he shared this with me, but he brought me in. Now this was the highest paying job in Cleveland at the time. They were paying, on average, $52,000 a year in 1980 to their employees. He said, 10% of our employees are alcoholics, 10% are drug addicts, 10% are gamblers, and 10% are either abusers or being abused. He goes, that's human resources. Now, which of those numbers do you think have gone up today? Alcohol's off the charts. Drugs are off the charts, okay? In Erie, Pennsylvania, a little town in Erie, Pennsylvania, 82% of people that apply for jobs don't pass drug, drug tests. 82%. Now, do restaurants have drug testing? No. Do hotels have drug testing? Yes. So when my, ch in, my students say they got to get a job, I tell them, stay away. From, and I'm a restaurant person. I say, stay away. There's too much bad activity going on in the restaurants. They're not screening. So you, I need to protect them. I don't want them going into a toxic environment. And they tell me how toxic it is. This is the dark triad. Machiavellianism is being manipulative. Narcissism is excessive self-love. That uh, article on um, why do so many incompetent men become leaders is because in the United States, what do we value? We value narcissism. Okay? Now, just who do we celebrate? Mark Zuckerberg, he stole the company, right? Google, we celebrate. They stole the company too. Okay? I mean, we celebrate people that made a lot of money and we don't care how they made it, right? So that's narcissism. And then psychopathy is actually a physical, um, how can I say that? A physical. Uh, well, this is your brain stem. The little bit of material right around your brain stem is supposed to be thick. And the, there's a great book, The Psychopath Whisperer. The, you, I absolutely recommend you read that book. It's a little tiny book. There's a 40-question exam on psychopathy. And these are people that will kill five, six people, not think anything about it, will rape five, six women or children, not think anything about it, they don't have the mental capacity to have empathy. The good news is there are two states, New Mexico and Minnesota, that have training centers that are identifying children with, that are psychopaths early and training empathy. You have to teach empathy. It's not there for everybody, okay? So, but that book, The Psychopath Whisperer, actually, the philosophy department had me read it. 
Does it work? Yes. Yeah. You have to teach. Yeah. Asians are also very, the Japanese believe you have to teach right and wrong. Yeah. Children don't necessarily get it by observing it, right? Yeah. You have to teach it. Okay. <clears throat> this is the Clifton Strengths 34. <coughs> now the bad news on this, this profile is free. Okay, if you just want to do the basic test, it's free. They charge, for, if you're a freshman at the college, I forgot how much they're charging a freshman, maybe $12. Uh, Some people are idea creators, input, intellection, learner, strategic. These are people that get things done. These are, they call this executing. So achievers, arrangers, belief, consistency, deliberative, discipline, focus, responsibility, restorative. Now, I'm restorative. I like to fix things. So everybody thinks I'm Debbie Downer because I see the bad, but when I see the bad, I see the fix. Right. I know how to fix it. I try to fix it. Okay, influencers, okay? My favorite one is who? So who are, what are politicians? <laughs> woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Activators, command, communication, competition, maximize your self-assurance and significance, and woo. Interestingly enough, I, get, I have, have had FYSE classes, because I'm in finance, I get mostly young men. I've had classes where every young man has competition as their number one. Um, and it, it's really funny. And I try to take that competition and help them understand that that mental strength can be used to help everybody and not just win, right? Is it hard? But I try it. Relationship builders, adaptability, connectiveness, developer, empathy, harmony, includer, individualization, positivity, and relator. Now, I tend to be an individualization. I can see the good and everybody. I'm very bad though, I don't see the bad. I am one of those people, I just don't see evil in people. But I sat with a woman at the training session who also had individualization, but she could pick out bad people. And I just am very bad at it. So if I, I've had a couple situations in life which were a little scary because I, I just don't see the red flags. My husband being the main one. Didn't see it coming. <laughs> okay? Strategic business unit plan. Now, Missions and values we talked about. It's got to be out three years. And you guys, this is not, you've got to sit down and write this all out today. You just start writing 15 minutes a day. You just start putting words on paper, okay? When you put the words on the paper, you will be able to create things. So we need to know, what are my strengths, my weaknesses, my opportunities, and my threats? You have to think of that as an organization. Meals on wheels. We've been growing 30% per year. We're growing like that. And what has the government done in terms of funding? It's cut our funding 10% since 2009. So I'm looking at a chart like this. I, I gotta, we got to figure out another way to do this. People, I have people walking into the senior center. I'm not kidding. Their belts don't hold their pants up anymore. Okay, when these people, I have delivered food to homes. There's not one stitch of food in the cabinet. There's not one stitch of food in the refrigerator. It's, I mean... I'm a, a half Italian and slow, I mean, I'm Slovak and Italian. We cook all the time. I still make my own bread. I cook all the time, and it makes me sick that people are walking in our front door, and we have not, at some, in July we ran out of food twice. September 18th, we had, we've had a 416% increase in need. Now, the state says they didn't cut food stamps. It's not true. It's, it might be a technical glitch, but people that were getting $150 a month for groceries are now getting $15. I mean, it's insane, and this is America. It doesn't make sense to me. So who are the clients you serve? Who are the donors that support you? Your employees. You've got to understand. Who's your, who are your future leaders in your organization? Okay? How are, you, are, how are your compensation and benefits? Are you going to pay yourself all the money? Okay? Are you going to have, are you going to have a balanced health care, life insurance, 401K? Are you going to match it? Annuity, long-term care. Now, the government offers a long-term care program where there's tax benefits to every company of three employees or more, but nobody offers it. Makes no sense to me. Okay, how are you going to recognize volunteers or future employees? Vendors, are your vendors, is there a conflict of interest with your vendors? I did not know that my number one vendor was paying my husband and my executive chef about $100,000 a year on the side. I found out when I moved to Charleston, and somebody showed me a contract. I've never seen these contracts before. That's a conflict with the vendor. There's tons of conflicts with vendors. You're the executive of an organization, and you hire your brother to fix the roof, and you let him charge you a little bit more. You don't get three to five written quotes. This happens all the time, okay? And who pays for that? The customer pays for that. 
either with higher price or less service. Okay, no kickbacks, always get three bids. And then your community is your environment. I was in Cleveland. How did I help make Cleveland better? I served on a lot of boards. I tried to help people. I, we tried to make the community better. Okay, that's all you can do. We, now, South Carolina is ranked the fifth most distressed state in the United States. There's a shitload of work we have to do here. People are very, very poor here. And, there, and no offense, Boeing ain't going to hire them. Okay? So we're going to have to figure another way to empower people. We're the lowest ranked school system in the United States. And when you're worse than Mississippi, you really got to be working hard at it. This isn't right. Okay? Now, I'm, a, I, I'm not a political person. I don't even understand or like politics. But I know how to do things. And if I can only influence one person a day, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, this is important. Now, if you take my financial planning class, we go over this for you and for a business and for a child. And I'm going to go through it both ways, okay? So, you notice there's no house or car on this picture. But we've trained all you Americans that the very first thing you do when you get a job is go get a new car. Uh, okay, a car costs $706 a month to operate. And that's why Americans put all of their excess cash in a car. And when they turn 65, they're stuck just with Social Security. And they can't stay here in Charleston anymore because they don't make enough to rent if they don't have a home. So, financial planning buckets are the same for people as they are for organizations. So, for a business or a nonprofit, you should have an operating reserve that covers 6 to 12 months of payroll. If they don't have 6 to 12 months of payroll covered, there's a problem. I don't believe the college has this. Then, life insurance. It's not just for the top executive. Group life insurance is for everyone in the organization, okay? The minimum you should see is $10,000, and it should be portable, which means if I'm working for McDonald's and I leave to go work for Burger King, I can take my $10,000 of insurance with me. So you want, I prefer that you do cash value life insurance, because term means when I'm 72, I don't have it anymore. Cash value stays with me forever, okay? To, well, to 100. So this should be cash value life insurance and portable. Retirement plans. Why do we only care about the top five guys? Everybody needs a retirement plan. If, they, if they've worked for you, I mean, this idea that you've got to work 20, 30 years to, to earn a pension is nuts. We don't have pensions anymore. I won't go into the accounting reason why we don't, but it's not right. So everyone needs either a 401k, and if you have a 401k, there should be a match. The reason you need the match is because with the 401k, you pay taxes when you take it out. If you don't have a 401k or a pension, then you need an individual retirement account. Everyone in this room should have an individual retirement account. And then finally, you need a Roth. So the Roth, you've paid all the taxes on the $100 that you have. Now you're going to put it in your Roth, okay? And that money's going to grow without taxation until you're very old. All right, now men on average live to 88. Women on average live to 92. My family goes to 104 on one side and 100 on the other side. So unless I see another van, um, I'm hoping to get another 40 years out of this ride. Okay. Now, do people run out of money at retirement that have pensions, 401ks? Absolutely. So one of the things you do with the 401k, I have a student right now that's 70 years old. He's got money in his 401k, but his planner said it's only going to last until he's 92. And his family lives to the hundreds. I said, well, you've got to roll that into an annuity. And the annuity is your last paycheck. Okay. You're 85, you got a ward on your nose, even Walmart's not going to hire you at 10 bucks an hour. But if you save money into an annuity, okay, that money will be with you until you die, and then you can also have one beneficiary as well. So, a contingency reserve. What is the profession of most of the people in our Congress? Lawyer. They're, they're lawyers. Now, when the country was founded, everybody was a farmer. So, Lawsuits happen to everybody. For-profits, non-profits, churches, everybody gets sued. Now, you can only sue somebody if you've got what? Money. Didn't you guys ever talk to an attorney? They say, you give me $5,000 cash and I'll start this lawsuit. You have $25,000, we can do a business lawsuit. Okay, now, so how many students do you have who've had their records expunged? Well, you, can get, you got caught drinking and you got a ticket, $5,000 will expunge your record. They'll never know what happened. So if you're a poor kid from North Charleston, you have $5,000 to expunge your record? No way. 
Okay, so contingency reserves are to cover unexpected contingencies like lawsuits and for capital projects. We want to maybe build a new building. Or maybe we want to bring in a new piece of equipment. If you remember the, uh, and I love Volkswagen, but remember the problem that they had with, um, what was that called? Uh, emissions? Yeah. Okay. The very first month, if you go back and read the articles, they came out and said, we have $20 billion of lawsuits right now, but we only have $8 billion in contingency. They didn't have enough money to cover those lawsuits. So maybe, if, again, and that's something you learn in finance, but that's what this is. Now for you guys, this is putting $15 a month in a stock index. Start with Robinhood, but I recommend Vanguard. I just started using Vanguard, but the least in fees. But that's how you protect yourself. $15 a month. Stop going to Starbucks twice a month. Put that $15 in a stock index fund. I don't care if the stock market's at $30,000. I don't care if it's at $8,000. You're going to buy it. You're going to put $15 a month as it goes up and $15 a month as it goes down. You're going to do it for the next 30 years. And when I'm dead and buried, you're going to say, thank you, Professor Fugo. Okay? And we learned this from Benjamin Graham who was Warren Buffett's professor at Columbia. This bucket here, for you all, every dollar that comes into your life, is try to save 15%. And you're going to say, Professor, I can't save that much money. Then start with a dollar. And don't tie this to your checking account. Do an online bank like Ally or Capital One, because they have a four-day hold before that money pops into your account. So when you see those brand new shoes that you just have to have, you can't transfer the money that quick. Right? So it stays there for you. So the last one is annuity and long-term care. Oh, so I'm an organization. So, so I'm running a for-profit business, and I sell it for $2 million. If I put the money in annuity, I know I'm protected till I die. I can protect my wife and my children till I die. So whenever God drops money at your feet, you want to fill all your buckets, but always put money in an annuity so that you're getting paid when you're old. Long-term care is your last room and board. You can't get that till you're 30 now. And I only recommend two insurance companies. There's 1,300. Only two that are AAA are Northwestern Mutual and New York Life. And in Charleston, we have a very good New York Life office. Now, writing grants is about collecting data. You all love to write, but this is where I want you to become the numbers people. And don't ever go by what people tell you. Okay, I'm always shocked at how people will say with confidence, this is how we do it in this organization, and then you do the research, and it's not the fact. <laughs> so every single person walking in your front door needs to be tracked. You need to collect that data. We collect it on a CRM, Client Relationship Management Software. Okay? Website analysis. How many visitors come to the site each month? I didn't put this down. What, are they, what pages are they visiting? What questions are being asked via contact? Are the tra is the traffic and donations, it should be, are the traffic and donations growing? How long do they sit on your page? Are they there less than a minute? Are they there three to five minutes? Okay, that data is very inexpensive to get. Okay, a DASH report. Everybody in business uses it. I haven't found many nonprofits. Daily activity of service history. Daily activity of sales history. Okay, how many people are you serving every day by location and what service is being provided? and what new services are being requested. Your customers are free consultants. They will tell you what they need. What do my homeless need? I just told my receptionist this morning, I said, Arcade, if anybody donates a tent, I need tents. They're sleeping out in the rain, the old guys are cold, I need tents. Let's put the word out, we need tents. Mm -hmm. Now that's not the long-term solution, but right now it's cold at night, mm -hmm. okay? Feedback. Okay, I learned this from Sherwin Williams. I rode the bus one morning with the head of data from Sherwin Williams. She was the head of customer service. And she taught me to track every single compliment and every complaint. You use that for training and you use that for your strategic opportunities. Okay, your customers will tell you what they need. And then keep a grants calendar by month, okay? You're going to keep it in a data system, but it's not visual, okay? So you need to know the deadline, the funding range, have you submitted it? Was it awarded? Was it denied? Now I'm going into more depth on all of this. So now uh, these are external information systems that are now. Charity Tracker is supported by you tried and United Way. Are you guys using Charity Tracker? Any of you? If you're in a nonprofit, you really should be using Charity Tracker. 
Um, AIM is a national, the government uses it. All I will tell you, it's the most screwed up information I've ever seen. They don't keep it current, but you're required, if you get government funding, you're required to use AIM. And right now, Trident Area Agency, uh, they, keep they keep track of the AIM. Okay, these are just, now you need to understand that nonprofits are rated. Okay, just like we have AAA bonds, AA bonds, triple C bonds, junk bonds, nonprofits are rated too. And the two top rating agencies are Charity Navigator and GuideStar. These organizations are online. They can help get you 990 information. They can get you the mission statement. What's 990 information? Uh, 990 is if you get a 501c3 filing, the IRS requires you to file a return every year that's called the 990. Oh. Okay? So with Charity Proud, Charity Proud is a system we use, so that's what I'm going to talk about here. I think it's $75 a month to start. Um, so we can track all of our volunteers, all of our donors, our prospective donors. I can track all the grants, and I can track the revenue sources, right? Because we might have, we might raise money with a car wash. We might raise money with a bake sale. We might have a special event. Community resources. I highly recommend this to all of you. Um, Charleston Area Grant Writers, we meet the third Tuesday of each month except December at the Charleston County Public Library. It's a small group of people. Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you. It's a small group of people, but some of these women have 30, 40 years of grant writing experience. The most important thing is you're going to meet some of the people that have, are the endowments and the foundations that have the money and actually be able to talk to the CEO of Sisters of Charity. Okay? So, the Charleston County Public Library has a foundation center. You all need to go over there. The young woman that runs this center will show you how to search databases. Writing grants is digging and digging and digging and digging and digging and digging. I mean, I've been doing this three going on four years. I'm shocked at how much, you know, that yesterday I found a new grant, and I've been looking at this stuff for years. Okay? So this is very important. And then um, there's, I'm, I'm showing you this, but there's monthly grant alerts that are sent out by the Charleston County Community Development Department. Um, you'll have to sign up for that. That is invaluable. And I can give copies of those to um, Ashley so you guys can see. I'm going to go over a few grants that apply to what you all do. Okay, now we're getting into grant writing. Community College Board of the Directors. And um, it was a college started in 1975. Um, it's, uh, it was a, it's the seventh largest community college in the United States, and they were receiving $80 million a year from the state of Ohio. Now, you have to understand how community colleges work. The federal government sends money to the state. The state sends money to the community college. Now, the sad thing about community colleges, and it took me 10 years to find this out, our graduation rate was 9%. Well, oh. Yeah. Wow. And they won't publish it. So most community colleges are the federal government getting money to states. The concept's called community college, but the graduation rates are abysmal. So you need to know that. Were well, there a lot of like, transfer to four-year They're poor students. They're married with kids. They get divorced. They're working full-time jobs yeah. for minimum wage. It's just hard. Okay? Yeah. And this is they partner with industry, but industry's not raising those incomes. Industry's declining those incomes. So it's just a tough thing. So Gloria Mooseman was their director of development. She was this tall. In February of 2009, we got a letter from the state of Ohio that said, we are not sending you $80 million this year due to the recession. Now that kind of letter comes to nonprofits all the time. In fact, I was just at a presentation where, the, where Trident United Way said, if the recession hits and we promise to fund you $50,000 a year, the year the recession hits, we may not be able to fund you. Okay, so this is not uncommon. So, Gloria Mooseman, this little tiny woman, she says, you know what? I know how to fix this. So, you literally, so I know many of you don't have manila folders anymore, but you're going to get a box of file folders, okay? You're going to set up files and your filing cabinets in the following manner. Now, who gives more money, the most money to nonprofits? It's individuals. Okay, it's individuals. But you have to, it takes a long time to develop relationships with individuals. And on top of that, not all CEOs and executive directors are good at this. 
Okay. Um, so you're going to be looking for the thing you'll find. I work with poor people in the afternoon. The thing that's amazing to us, the poorest of the poor we work with, they send us a dollar to five dollars almost quarterly. The richest people we work with, trying to get a hundred dollars out of them is like pulling teeth. Okay, so it's just like President Obama and Bernie Sanders, they both said the same thing, that most of their donations came from small donors. Yeah. So building a database with that information becomes even more critical, because you're not going to have 10 people supporting you. It might be 10,000 people supporting you. That's why you need a client relationship database. Foundations. Foundations are very good for giving, and family foundations are even better. Now, what's a family foundation? So dad ran a business for 30 years. He sold it for $40 million. They already had three homes and six cars and two boats. What was he going to do with the rest of the money before he died? A smart thing to do is to set up a family foundation and teach your children and grandchildren how to be philanthropic. Okay, so you have Warren Buffett and Bill and Melinda Gates. They have decided to take the most of their wealth and use philanthropy. Okay, that, that is the most important thing you can do with money is set up a foundation and teach your children how to be philanthropic. Business charities. The bad news is businesses don't want to give you money. They want to pay bonuses to their top five guys. It's only about 5% of giving. We think they talk a good game, but they're actually not that big. Now, government, government is the biggest part of our donations. But what's happening to our donations from the government? They're going down. So we've got to scramble to fill these other pockets of money. Okay, so when you will have a filing cabinet. One drawer is going to say individuals. Now, I have two categories, individuals and high net worth individuals. My high net worth individuals are people that have given us $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, okay, or more. And then you have a foundation drawer, a business charities drawer, and a government drawer. You have every folder. There's a couple things I'm going to ask you to write on the folder. And you're going to laugh and you say, Denise, you don't need to do that because you're going to keep it all in the system, okay? Institutional knowledge. Create a frequently asked questions spreadsheet. And interview everyone in your organization, especially people about to retire. Collect their knowledge. We are very bad at doing this. We let people retire after 30, 40 years of work. We don't even give them a watch anymore. We let the door hit them in the butt. And we don't collect any of the knowledge that they've accumulated. So I was blessed. One of the women I worked with for just a few months had worked for DSS and for our organization for 40 years. We had happened to have a woman, a 70-year-old woman, walk through our front door crying. She had been raped, 70 years old. And you think, who would rape a 70-year-old woman? I'm sitting with Jackie, and Jackie says, you know, this just makes me so sad. And I said, Jackie, what's the youngest child you've ever seen raped? 18 months. Jackie, what's the oldest person you've ever seen raped? 85 years old. I said, Jackie, who does this? People on alcohol. Alcoholics are very abusive. And it's usually the dad, the uncle, or the boyfriend. My best friend actually was raped by her older sister's boyfriend. But alcohol, people on alcohol will rape children to, to very old women. And you don't know this. I would have never known that. Because she started to tell me this, who did I reach out to? People against rape. So I started talking to them. Because I didn't have a lot of knowledge about this. And then I started building. In fact, I have it in my pocket or into my coat. What are, how did I get to darkness to light? Because I talked to Jackie, and she sent me to this other woman, and then she sent me to darkness to light. See, how you, I'm curious, and I build knowledge because of it. You have to use the information that you collect to improve your services going forward. The website should not be stuck in the technology department because the technology department doesn't talk to customers. Okay, you work with the technology department to, to use your customers' words. Okay? When the customer sends you a wonderful letter about your service, it goes on your website. It goes in your communications to your customers. Collect your stories from your clients. At the very end, I'm going to show you one of the stories from one of our clients. If you want to get a grant, you better have a database of stories that you have collected. Okay? Typically in organizations, we don't do this. So think of it as customer complaints and customer praise. And list that praise on your website. You get their permission to use their words. Okay?
Oh, um, I don't know if you all listen to StoryCorps, but yes. StoryCorps has an app. Yeah. Use the, I mean, I'm dealing with people that are 60, actually 55 to 104 years of age. I'm having trouble getting the concept along that we've got to get them all interviewed and put them on StoryCorps. They all have unique stories, okay? And doesn't it go to like the um, like the National Archives? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to work there. No. <laughs> okay, call center systems technology. This is where I see nonprofits being very, very behind the eight ball. Okay, um, we service 780 people every month. Okay, for with old people, uh, like the one homeless man I interviewed this week. He was married three times, all three wives are dead. He had a brother and a sister, they're both dead. Um, and, there, and his mom and dad are dead. There is no one left in this man's world, okay? So who talks to these people, anybody? Yeah. So one of the things that I try to do, I have an intern that I, I'm lucky to get, is I have my intern, we call the clients once a month just to talk to them. We call right now to ask if any of them are veterans or if they were married to a veteran so we have better data for my grants that I submit to veterans organizations. We ask, how are we doing, and can we be of help or service? Okay, now some people hate the food we deliver to them. Okay, it's unfortunate, but it's not the highest quality. And then we can, once I have that information, now I can start partnering with organizations that can help support my clients. We get a lot of calls from seniors that have a home, but they have no money for repair. So I've been trying to bug Habitat for Humanity could you just help us with repairs? I'll get grant funding if your volunteers can help us. Okay? Call and speak with these organizations. Meet at least annually. So what we where we have grown is Meals on Wheels of Charleston. Because of Renee, we have Stone Soup Collective that works with us every Friday. And we have Food Rescue. And then we have the College Stone Soup Collective working with us on Wednesdays. And we have Food Rescue USA, which we've partnered with. But this should have 30 organizations on it. Now, through our senior companions, we've partnered with 11 organizations. Through our foster grandparent program, we've partnered with 26 schools. And who did I miss? No, nope, that's it. Okay? But this requires you to not send emails back and forth, but to get your butts out of your seats, go to a room once a year with flip charts and markers, and do some deep strategic thinking about what we can do. So I'm going to share this with you. After meeting, after working for three to four years with all these organizations in town, most of them don't do anything. Okay, they're taking up air. Where do I see low-hanging fruit in terms of service opportunity? The, the library system actually is one of our strongest social systems. They allow the homeless in there all day. They help the homeless with job applications. They help the homeless with resumes. They welcome the homeless. Now, there is not one other organization. In fact, when I first started working at Meals on Wheels, they wouldn't let the homeless in. Okay, because I agreed to do intake and let them in. Who else? Which is an organization that has thousands of people on them every day and they don't know anything about their customers? CARTA. So I sit on the CARTA board, not the board board. I sit on the poor people's board, the community board. Okay, how easy would it be for us to start collecting data on every rider? Now, it's on CARTA that, no, doctors ride CARTA from Mount Pleasant, nurses ride CARTA. But I look for people that I, once you start working with homeless, you start to see the signs. How big is that backpack? What kind of shoes are they wearing? Is there a shirt under that jacket? How many plastic bags do they have on them? And I start my conversation. Do you have enough food today? Because I work at a place we can get you more food. Do you have secure housing for tonight, a place to sleep? Okay. Now, if you have no eye, remember the disc? If you have zero eye, are you going to ask anybody for help? Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry, I have to go. <laughs> Are you going to ask anybody for help? No. Okay. And if you have no D, how hard are you going to fight against the system? You're not a fighter. So this idea that we can all work hard and things are just going to be peachy keen is BS. We don't all have the right same skills. Some of us are going to be able to work hard to help others. Okay, and others are animals. I ran restaurants all my life, and I was a very large caterer. I ran fine dining. Most of my students, most of my employees had never been outside of Ohio. None of them had ever been to a world-class restaurant. Most of them didn't know how to cook. 
and most of them have never sat down for dinner with their family. And today, have things gotten better or worse? They're eating bars and shakes. Don't know anything about food. Can't even shop today. Okay, so you have to realize that no one trains people how to answer the phone properly. You have to have a script, and you have to tell them the kind of data you're trying to collect. You have to teach people to listen, right? How do you knock on a door? How do you ask a question? How do you listen to a child? A teenager, a student, a mom, a grandmother, a senior. How do you listen to somebody that's in distress right now? You're not a psychologist, but you're in the position to lead and fix the situation right now. How do you do that? Okay, when I was in New York, I was scared to death to talk to the homeless. I don't know what happened when I moved down here, but God gave me the skills to start trying and not being afraid anymore. Everything is learned for the first time. Don't assume your people know how to, I mean, I'm learning that, I assume that freshmen know how to read a book, and I am learning every day that they do not know how to read a book comprehensively. That's what I learn every single day. So how don't to write emails. Huh? How to write emails. They don't even do that anymore. <laughs> but you don't assume people know what world class behavior is. Most Americans are never going to eat in a five star restaurant. There are some exceptions in this room now with respect to email writing. Just out of case. <laughs> oh, you guys are very talented. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
magazines, radio stations, television stations, they still matter. Okay? Um, what, if your platform is only a social media one, you're missing a large segment of the population. You've got to use everything. Okay? So what I used to do, and we did this at the National Restaurant Association, um, at the one organization I was helping, I was the editor for 15 minutes a week. All the young people that were working on different segments came to meet with me. We, looked, we, we reviewed pictures together. We reviewed copy together. We made our changes. We made our edits. They left my office, and then we went and posted. Okay? You have to be very careful as an organization. A lot of organizations get messed up right here. Okay? Because somebody, there weren't enough people looking at what was written. And all, this is just, this is where more heads are better than, you know, many more are better. So your newsletter number two is your constant contact. Most CRMs now, you can run your constant contact right through your CRM system. So they make it easy. Your 990s post, that's required. Website and a blog, blogs do still matter. Okay, but if your blog is only updated once a year or done once every three months, then you might not want to do the blog. Okay? Invite people to write to you that you can post to the blog, but you have to edit it. LinkedIn, I hate all these organizations. Whatever you post on LinkedIn, LinkedIn owns. However, uh, LinkedIn does have a publishing platform. Write about things you don't care if they own it. Okay? They have an, you can push a lot of information through LinkedIn. Facebook, Evil Empire. The key thing here, <laughs> you, you need to have a website in addition to Facebook. A lot of organizations are just doing Facebook, but grants, people that evaluate grants, they want to evaluate your, your website first and Facebook. I know more people coming off of Facebook than joining it, and I know they say it's for grandparents now, but um, uh, it, it's a, I can't even tell you, um, I had a, a friend that was very, very vocal politically on um, Facebook, lived in the same house for 25 years, and had their affordable health care pulled for three months, somebody with critical illness. And what, what do you think, how do you think that happened? It's called administrative cutbacks. It's what they do with administrative regulations. They don't have to eliminate the program. They just have to cut back who they're giving it to. That's what we're seeing with food stamps. And that's what they did with affordable health care. So this person was old, but they were professional. And I said, you know, you can't, this is not free speech. <laughs> I said, you can't be out there slamming these politicians. They're going to come after you, which they did. So he has liver disease, and he missed three months of appointments, and it's going to take another 60 days for him to get approved for some critical tests, all because he was too political on Facebook. So you, you guys just have to watch. And I'm going to tell you that most of the young women in TLT, when they write, they do not use their own names anymore. Okay. Did you guys meet that woman, Mary Jackson, that the, the glacier scientist that came to Charleston? She's a PhD. She had to, she all she writes is research papers on glaciers. She had to stop using her name. She was getting attacked on her glacier research. Oh, about climate uh, climate change. The climate change, change people came after her. <gasps> yeah. So she goes by M. Jackson because she was getting attacked. She was a thirty-some-year-old woman. This is crazy. Okay, Instagram is actually, I mean, it's owned by Facebook. It's doing better. YouTube channels are important. I think YouTube, uh, again, it's Google. They own whatever you post. But uh, and you have to understand, there's lawsuits against Facebook. A number of people started businesses on Facebook, and after growing very successful businesses, Facebook pulled them in. Facebook owns them. And those, oh yeah, they, I think it was on 60 Minutes, and they interviewed all the people that they'd been running very successful businesses. It was their income. But you don't own any of that stuff. So write this down. I should have put this on here. Make sure that if you start a website, a blog, a YouTube channel, you want a common creative license. You have to go to the advanced search options and make it a common creative license, which means you're paying for the hosting and you own the content. Now, people can use the content, but if they choose to use it in their business model, they have to pay you something. Okay, that's the only way you're protected. Otherwise, it's evil empire time. So we always thought it was going to be that little mouse. Okay, this generation is a visual generation. I can't suggest enough. Take lots of pictures, lots of videos. Document, review with team. Now, I ran a very successful restaurant for 20 years for very high-profile men. 78% of my customers were men. 
We always got in trouble when we would take pictures of the dining room. And why did we get in trouble? Because they were not there with their wives. Okay? So you just have to be a little sensitive when you're doing photography. Try to get approvals first. Um, you know, because what happens is, you know, CEO of a company will come up to you and say, Denise, I'm going to sue you right now if you use that photograph. That's not my wife sitting with me. Oops, okay. All right? So you just got to be sensitive with photography. Again, review it with your team. Edit visually. Edit the copy. Post it. Our rule of thumb, when, when, you know, when you're managing a social media team, is if you get 50 likes on something you post, it's probably a success. Okay? If, you're get, if you have somebody doing posts and they're getting five responses, seven responses, you probably don't have the right person in that position. Okay? Because somebody that knows what they're doing with social media, they'll routinely get 50 likes on everything they do. Okay? Special events. Now, this is the business that I was in. I did, um, I did more benefits in Cleveland than anybody else. I was very big in weddings. I did a lot of corporate events, and I ran the largest conference center between New York and Chicago um, for that community college, actually. Um, you can raise a lot of money here. I partnered with Wolfgang Puck from 1986 to, what, 1996, I think? And we raised uh, almost $2 million for the Jest. If you're going to start raising money with food and service, you need excellent food and service. Otherwise, you're going to go to a different party. <laughs> you need to pick a rich woman in the community that's already very rich and established as your honorary chair. Okay? Because rich people like to talk to other rich people. They're not going to talk to service people. Okay? And the most important thing that I've ever seen, select five honorary chairs. Select your leadership team for the next five years. Always have five women in position. Sometimes you'll get some men that will do this as well. I had some architects, actually, that like to serve as honorary chairs. Honorary chairs, sells they sell tickets. So if, if you have an honorary chair, they're going to pick ten of their friends, and each of their friends has to sell a table of ten. And that's how you raise money. And if you have five people meeting over five years and building a manual on that event, so the debutante ball for the Akron Children's Hospital, that's the model they used. They always had five leaders, this year's honorary chair, and then honorary chairs for the next four years. And they had 1,000 people minimum every year at their debutante ball. And they were able to have, they never, they never had a glitch. Even through the recession, they never had a glitch. Wow, a pyramid scheme that, is work, that works well. Yeah, it's a very good organizational structure. I've never heard of that. Yeah, and, that, and that's... Um, uh, and then you've got to create operations manuals. Okay, you've got to have a manual for the event. You can't say it's in a computer because those computers, the systems change all. I mean, I had my first computer in 1980. It was a Xerox because IBM didn't have a computer yet. Well, what do you think happened to all that data by 1990? How many times had the systems changed? So paper notebooks are still the way you keep information. Okay? Um, make your event really special. If you're not going to do a great job, don't do it. And don't ask people to work for nothing. Okay? If you're smart about this, you can actually properly pay people to do the work they have to do. Raise the money you need to raise. Okay? Um, and I also the National Restaurant Association, we raise a ton of money through golf outings. If, you're con if your donor base is predominantly male, I mean, we, had, we have one golf outing every year at Pebble Beach and one at Pinehurst a year. We've been doing it for 20-some years. We raise millions of dollars to two golf outings. And what do we put that money towards? Scholarships for students to go to culinary or hospitality management schools. So this is important, but this does not, this, this not lead the process. You understand? This is one step. Okay, sponsorship levels. How are you going to recognize your donor? Okay, most people don't think about this. Are you going to have a platinum, gold, or silver lever letter? Are you going to have um, founders' names? Are you going to have like I, Satili was an important person in our history, so we have a Satili level. If you give us so much money, you're going to be on the Satili Wall of Fame, right? Rockefeller was Rockefeller is important in your organization. Okay, how do you want to honor them? Okay, grants, online applications, and letters of interest. On every folder that you have, you need to understand what the giving guidelines are. And the guidelines change all the time. Okay? So the giving guidelines mean I'm only going to donate money 
for programs that deal with children. I'm only going to deal with programs where the children are in poverty. And I'll only deal with education projects that deal with at-risk children. Those are my giving guidelines. So if you fit in any of those guidelines, send me a letter. Call me. Pull down my grant application. Okay? Deadlines change all the time. So the grant this year was due on June 4th. But in December, they have a new boss at that position, and so they decide, I want to go on vacation that month. I'm going to make the grant due February 25th. If you're not checking and updating, you're going to, you'll, you'll miss an important grant. If you are, now, some grants you're still doing paper. Some grants are online forms, and they are all different qualities. Some of them are horrifically bad, and some are very good. If you, some you have to hand deliver. If you hand deliver, get a postmarked receipt. Okay? Because if I am taking all the packages, I used to have this happen with RFPs. I have to deliver this to the county. The person accepting the packages has a brother-in-law that's also submitting a bid. All he has to do is say that mine came after 5 o'clock. Right? You have to get a stamp. And there's always people in organizations like this. You always have to get a postmark receipt. Now, I do want to show you this because this applies to Office of Sustainability. I say that open, right? Maybe not. Maybe shift click? Shift? Or is it control click? I've never lent it to you. Okay. Oh, you might have to go out of presentation mode. Yeah, I'll stay in presentation. I'm too nervous. Okay. We're, I, what I'll, at the very end, I'll go back to this, okay? So this is right down Cliff Bar Family Foundation. So you all know those bars that they make for people that hike and are active, right, runners and things. They actually, actually, we give quite a bit of them to the homeless and the Meals on Wheels because they, they flow through us. Um, Cliff Bar has money for sustainability and environmental issues. Now, their deadline was October 1st, but I'm going to take you to their site. All of these organizations usually have five survey questions. Be very careful answering the survey questions, because if you answer one of those questions wrong, you're not allowed into their grant application. So it's going to say, are you a 501c3? It's going to ask if you're giving political contributions. It's going to ask if you're interested in environmental. It's going to ask you five questions, but again, be careful, because if they don't look onerous, but if you answer one wrong, it'll say you are denied from entering our grant application software. So that's an important step. Oh, some or a lot of organizations don't have an application. You have to send a letter. Okay, so it's LOI, letter of interest. Okay, you can send a simple letter and get $1,000. Okay, but somebody's got to write the letter and somebody's got to review it. Um, then there's a lot of nonprofit, there's a lot of granting organizations that are um, only by invitation only. So they will only, they will contact your organization if they're interested in giving to you. Now that does not mean you shouldn't talk to them. It means you have to do a sell. And you may call them and they say, you know what, Denise, we really appreciate the great work you're doing in the community, but we're not interested in funding you. Don't be hurt. Just post that in your CRM and check back with them next year. Because um, when I tell you things change all the time in giving, it, it really does. And it's sort of funny, government grants, it's what's the soup of the day. Every, like, <laughs> Me Too movement started, Victim, now, all the grants, federal grants, are victim-related. I mean, it's sort of funny. Or the immigration issue, lots of money for immigration. <laughs> or, 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 or learning English. Okay, grant applications, paper versus online. Online grant applications are all different. Okay? Save every page. No matter what it says, save every page. Because some of them don't work as well as they think they work. They have word counts and character limits. So don't work in the application. Work in Docs or Word. Cut, you know, save, copy what you've done, and paste it. Because you're always going to. If you put in too many words, the application won't submit. <coughs> the formatting in these problem, these programs sucks. To be polite, so you can't copy a whole Word document and paste it. Excel, forget it. Doesn't transfer at all. So um, unless you're allowed to upload your documents, that works. Uploading is probably the best format. Um, 
Decisions on whether you get a grant or not, many times are only past, posted online. Walmart, you have to go to their site to see if you're awarded or denied. Smaller organizations will send you a letter or an email and say, in fact, today, right before I left, I, I got a notice that we got $1,200 from an organization. It was a very three-page grant application, and we got $1,200 first time in our company's history. So I was very excited about that. Call the organization to follow up if there's no response. Um, make sure you always have two names on an application, the grant writers and the executive directors, um, and both emails. Um, sometimes there are applications that you can't make copies of. You can't upload it to your system. You have to fill it out online and submit it. So for those of you that cook, you have to be ready with mise en place, which means all of your ingredients, everything that needs to be right there, because you're going to start this project, you can only go forward, you can't go back, and when you hit submit, that's it. But a lot of them, okay? So have everything ready right there. Right. So you're not, you know, and you, you know, because if you don't do that, you're going to have to re redo that application multiple times. And then when you're done, in my organization, I keep a copy of everything because I've got my filing system in place. The CFO only keeps it, she keeps every application by year. That's all she does. I keep everything by um, segment. Okay, so this is, um, I want you to understand, I'm going to give you the back story, the context. Um, so I'm from Cleveland, and it's very ironic. I have been applying to grants to Sisters of Charity for the last three years. Now, Sisters of Charity is the largest endowment in the state of South Carolina. This year, they have $110 million. And they're the only char state charity that works in every county in the state, and they will fund startups. So I'm showing you the questions that they ask on their application. Okay? They look for creative, they look for problem solvers, um, and they look for... Um, uh, and they're, they're not looking to fund you forever. They're looking to help you get started get your, and get your organization going. They'll help you as much as they can. The interesting thing I found out is I used to cater for Sisters of Charity in Cleveland. So I did some research and research and research, and lo and behold, the Sisters of Charity in Cleveland opened hospitals in Cleveland. And then there was such a need, they came down to Columbia. And when hospitals, unfortunately, this was a big mistake. We decided to let hospitals go from being nonprofit organizations to for-profit organizations, right? Big, big mistake. Okay. So interestingly enough, this Sisters of Charity, if you go back and read it, it's it's basically the same people that run the Sisters of Charity in um, uh, in Cleveland. And my one daughter always tells me, "Mom, you should go be a nun." And I said, well, I don't know if I really want to be a nun. But my daughter thinks I should be a nun. Well, I went online, and guess what they have? If you like doing charitable work, they actually have a special uh, designation and training program for people that just want to help in the community. So I'm going to do that. Okay? I don't have to be a nun, because that scares me a little bit. But <laughs> so let's go through these questions. Yeah, you have a question? So the very first time you go on to these organizations, you have to register as the grant writer, okay? And if somebody used to be a grant writer 10 years ago, you're sponsoring organization, what's your address, mailing address, city, state, zip code, phone, fax, and email. Now, do you all understand what a tax identification number is? Okay, so you have to file, you gotta register with the state of South Carolina, and you gotta register with the federal government, I'm told that the federal government is getting very, I, I thought it was very fast online, but somebody just told me at a meeting that is, uh, it's, it's gotten very slow. This is required, this number is required on every grant you fill out. Um, what's your total organization budget? Um, so program revenues, by, this is where I was gonna get into some accounting, but I decided not to, um, since we're already at 60 some slides. What's your revenues by program? So if you have six programs, you're going to show all six programs, what are your revenues, what are your expenses, okay? You, you always want to operate with excess revenues, okay? If you, rev if you can operate by breaking even or better, funders will want to help you. If you are always having revenue shortfalls that shows you can't manage money, you're not strategic, they don't want to help you. 
So it's, are you working in the green or are you working in the red? Okay? And basically, when they say you're operating in the black, that really means you're operating with excess revenues. So excess revenues would be equal to profit. Am I making money in this business or not? Okay. Current year revenues, um, make sure you understand for nonprofits, um, it's not just cash. You might get gifts of stock. You might get bonds. You might get a, a, donate, a charitable donation. We get tons of furniture at Meals on Wheels. We get tons of clothing. We get tons of food. We get grooming supplies. It takes one lady pretty much five hours every day just to post the donations we get. Now, with the new tax law, you could actually say maybe we don't need it. We will need the information, and plus, and then we send it. I send actually the thank you letters. Uh, I send written thank you letters to people that give us things. Okay, and um, not an email because they're not going to open it. They have to open them at something that comes in the mail. And interestingly enough, the more little note cards I send, the more donations I get from those people. So I don't mind handwriting them. Okay? So in-kind contributions can be an important source of nonprofit revenue. Okay? So with the new tax law, people don't need the tax write-offs as much anymore. Um, but I still think it's important for people to know that you recognize them for everything that they donated. Okay, grant application questions. Current year expenses. What were your revenue budgeted revenues for the prior year? budgeted expenses for the prior year, your actual revenues, and your actual expenses. The reason they're asking you these questions, they want to know if you're good at budgeting. Did you budget $100,000 in expenses, but you spent $150,000? That tells me you're not good at budgeting or you're not good at expense control. So somebody like me, where numbers are like poetry, I can look at numbers and I say, well, they're not doing a good job here, they're not doing a good job here, they, we, they're doing good here. Okay, so somebody like me, I read, to me this is cold. And don't understand that you're sending it to a nonprofit, to a foundation, but they've got a team of financial experts looking at your numbers. Okay? And then number of years in operation. It was funny. They did not know how many years we were actually in operation. When I had the organizations do research for us, they were having a party for our 50th year in business. We actually had been in business 52 years. <laughs> so. Don't assume that everybody really knows. It's part of your job. You're, you're, the, the grant writing is building brand. It's marketing. Okay? You need to know. So we've been in business 52 years. National Restaurant Association, I believe, was started in 1917. And why were we started? Because a bunch of restaurateurs got upset because the price of eggs were escalating. And that's why the National Restaurant Association got started. Okay. Do you have a website? This is a thing I find a problem. A lot of organizations don't have websites anymore. This is the largest endowment in the state. They want to see your website. Do you have a blog? Do you have Facebook? Do you have LinkedIn? Do you have Twitter? I didn't put Instagram on here, but you know the flavor of the day will continue to change. So those are the ones that are asked. Okay, who's the president or executive director? I had to go in yesterday and say, do you guys really prefer Ms. or Mrs.? Because I really didn't, had never asked, and I thought I'd better ask. So what's the prefix, first name, last name, suffix, and title? Okay, office address, city, state, postal code, phone, fax, email. Now, this is the program title. What was the name of the program that you wanted to write about? You said for Green? Oh, what's Green Heart. Green Heart Project. So what is, is there a specific, that's the name of the nonprofit. Yeah. What's the specific program you're trying to raise money for? Um, environmental education. Okay, perfect. That's the program title right there. And that actually, that title actually would be able to get him grants in two different program giving guy Education, right, and gardening. Two di that's two different giving areas. And th th when you have a title like that, that's very good. So, okay, if, if any of you have ever worked in a business where you have to price a product, how much money you ask for, either from a customer or from a foundation, it, there's a science to it. Okay, so one of the very first things they teach you in the food service business is never price anything to the zero, ever. Shows you haven't sharpened your pen. Okay, <laughs> and is this the first time you're requesting money? And what are the ranges? What I have learned is they're not truthful on the ranges. They'll say we'll give from $500 to $5,000. 
And then when you talk to the CEO, he'll say, well, you know, we work with a couple organizations that do such a phenomenal job. We give them a million dollars. I'm like, a million? That's not even on your form. <laughs> okay? So if it's a first-time grant, don't be too aggressive. You just want to get on their list. Okay? Um, well, they only give you one grant. Some organizations will just give you one grant. Sometimes you have to get the grant through a volunteer that is an employee of their foundation, of their organization, okay? It's like if you want money from CarMax, a CarMax employee needs to volunteer with you, and then if they volunteer with you and like you, they can apply for the grant, okay? Um, is the grant annual, or is it every other year, or is it a three-year commitment, okay? Um, should you use round numbers or to the penny? I, I believe it's better to use 4,893. And they're going to ask you to show you the Excel spreadsheet anyway, so show the real numbers. Don't, don't round it because that shows you're not serious. Um, program area, select from their giving guidelines, education, health, environmental. That was just an, an idea. Geographical area served by program. Uh, this is very, very important, and you really do need the zip codes. And again, this is drilling down, okay? So when I first started, they said we feel pe feed people in Charleston County. Then I got to the director of finance. I said, do we really just feed people in Charleston County? Because when I look at this other program, we got people coming from all three counties. Well, lo and behold, we feed people in Dorchester and Berkeley just along the edges. But you know what? Now that we have that data, we are able to raise more money because of it. Because now I got money coming in from Dor Dorchester and Berkeley. So most people are going to blow you off when you say, I really need it down to the zip code. You need it as far down as you can go. The deeper you go, the more money you'll be able to raise. Okay, participants served by program. Um, they want to know your South Carolina, your congressional districts, and who serves you from the Senate. Again, what's your organizational mission statement? And I want you to understand, I was very, very blessed. Started a company in 1980. Our, our, we called our company City Life. Our mission was to bring world class food, beverage, service, ambiance, and management leadership to food, service, to food service in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, that mission statement, I didn't write that. You know who helped me write that? My graphic designer. She, we sat for three hours in our restaurant under construction, and her name's Catherine Capp. She says, we're not leaving until we understand exactly why you're doing this. And that's, that mission statement still continues, okay? That mission statement still continues. So the mission statement needs to really be about the passion of what you're doing. And again, remember, use your history statement. And what are your organizational values? Your organizational values are usually different than your personal values. Okay? But you need to have them. And if you write about them, it's important. Okay, now these are their questions. So this is a little bit more detail. So everybody that works for Sisters of Charity has advanced degrees. They're extremely good writers. Okay? And they ask really detailed questions. Give a brief one paragraph summary describing the program which funds are requested. What barriers do individuals and families experience poverty in their community face? And how does your organization address these barriers? Now, most of the time, they're going to give you a word limit or a character limit. And if you go over, the application won't go through. Please describe your organization's knowledge about the poverty issue you are addressing and previous results illustrating your impact. If you're going to illustrate your impact, you need data, right? OK? Include all data points tracked. And I'm actually, at the very end, going to show you the data points that I tracked that got me money for homeless breakfast. How do the people you serve give input to the program? Surveys, community forums, advisory council. We don't do this, but wouldn't it be great if all the homeless came together for a meeting once a month and talked about what's going through? Now, it's hard. Homeless men are very, very ornery. It's very funny how I tried to hit, get some homeless men to, to share uh, a rental apartments together. It was a complete disaster. They need to be separate. But wouldn't it be interesting if I could bring them all together and we could talk about this? So um, what if they advised us on what their needs were, as opposed to me trying to pull everything out of them? At Sisters of Charity Foundation, our mess, mess, mission is best fulfilled when we embrace diversity, advance equity, and promote inclusion. I'm sorry about this. How does your organization go beyond non-discrimination statement to embrace diversity, advance equity, or promote inclusion? 
How many participants do you project to serve through this program or project? Now understand that some organizations um, will fund your whole organization. Some will only fund a specific program. Some will only do a specific project. Some will finance a special event. Some will give you gift cards. Some will allow you to come onto their property and solicit donations. So there's, this can go into very, very deep levels. If your organization doesn't want to work on Saturdays or in the evenings, you can forget all that other stuff because it's mostly Saturdays and evenings. Okay, how you projected this number and include any demographic information related to this project. You are going to have to build to do Excel. Okay? I had so many people tell me, you can't collect homeless data. You can't do this. It was crazy. I said, I can. I'm just asking the same question to every person. I started giving disk profiles now to the homeless. It's very interesting. A lot of them have no eye. They're not going to ask for help. Okay, state at least two specific goals expected for this grant. What steps will you take to reach the goals? What other organizations does your nonprofit partner with? Government, civic, volunteer, faith faith, other nonprofits. And how do you partner? This is important. You need to write a memorandum of understanding. Okay? You can say you're going to partner with somebody, but if you don't actually have a plan of action of how you're going to partner with that organization, it ain't really going to happen. Now, I've seen very short ones that are effective, but this is really where I would at least think of a three-page executive summary that says, you know what, we're going to work together on this, we're going to meet monthly, we're going to collect this data, we're going to review this data, we're going to go to grant, grant we're writing together. You need to have a memorandum of understanding. And based, it on, based on your requested amount, please provide a breakdown of how you anticipate funding to be spent. That's an Excel spreadsheet or a spreadsheet showing how you're going to spend the money or where it fits in in terms of the overall budget. Okay, we're not done yet. Please list other organizations from which you have requested funding for this program and the status where you awarded pending decline. If no other funds have been requested, please explain why. If you're only asking me for money and you're not asking anybody else, you're not a dynamic organization. You're not world class, right? Simple. Okay, now, I, I keep all my data in Excel. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in most online applications. So I recommend using Word or Docs and setting up a simple table just showing the name and the amount and whether it was awarded or declined. It can be three or four columns. Um, that works the best so far. Disclose any individuals or businesses that you have engaged and contracted with for consulting or coaching services in the past 12 months. Why do they ask just about consulting and coaching? Because if you're like me in Old Broad, you've been in a lot of organizations. Where do people start wasting lots of money in organizations? Consultants. Okay, I've been in organizations where the staff is getting paid $200,000 a year. They don't do much but go to conferences, and they hire consultants to do the work. So if you're a consultant coming into an organization to get them more profitable, the very first thing you look at, consulting contracts. And then who's getting those contracts? Is it your sister? <laughs> okay. There's a lot of collusion right there, and that's why they ask that question. Um, and I don't want you guys to think I'm negative about it. I love business. The reality is, if there is money, there is theft. And the people that know how to steal are very, very good at it. Okay, very good at it. Full disclosure of all names and businesses, etc. The foundation is committed to supporting nonprofits in South Carolina. This is important. I have a page for this. Now, if they're giving you money and they're going to fund you over a period of years, they want you to get stronger. Remember those buckets? You're getting stronger if you're filling those buckets. We have $100,000 in our operating reserve. We have $50,000 in our contingency reserve. We have health insurance for all of our employees. We have a retirement plan for all. That shows that you understand how to build an organization. Okay, so what are your top three most pressing needs that, if strengthened, would build your organization? Now, I did add one because I thought they were missing one in my humble opinion. Okay, so... This is an important slide. Okay, we talked about the L word. Leadership. You have to build staff and board leadership. You have to invest in talent. You have to bring in the right people. You have to develop the right people. And you're going to make mistakes, okay? Do you have a mission, vision, and strategy? I mean, I would go, you know, the first, and I'm going to play with Dr. Lavender here. I want to read your strategic plan. 
I want to help you with your strategic plan. Okay? What are the next three years going to look like? I don't care what the university says. Because this organization could exist outside the university. Right? Let's just get the plan done. Human resources. If you don't have compensation strategy, recruitment, training, talent development, certification requirements, okay, then you're going to hire warm bodies. Okay? That's what restaurants do. Who's the warmest body we can bring in to cover the shift? Right? We don't want that. We want to actually go out and find people who have the same passion we have, the skills that we need, and are willing to learn. Um, program delivery. How good are you at executing your program? Do you get the job done? Fund development. Do you need help with fundraising strategies? I'm willing to help anybody that needs help. Okay, financial management. This, this, I can't tell you how important this is. Okay. Not only do you need an X, I actually think that might be the most important position in any organization. Because the financial management, especially for nonprofits, especially if you're getting government money, the reporting is very difficult. So at the National Restaurant Association, we run, an we run a program called ProStart. We started it with four high schools in 1996, and today we have 2,000 high schools. We're in 49 states, all branches of the military, all the territories. What we were doing, it's the number one training program for 15 and 16 year olds to come into our industry. Three times we raised $1.4 million from the Department of Labor. Three times, because we have a best in class program. And I said, why did we only apply for three times? You know what they told me? Because our finance team hated doing the government reporting. Now is, that, now, is that right? So what would I do? I bring in a new director of finance. Now, the woman that I work with, who's been doing her job 20 years, is the best at government reporting I've ever found. She's phenomenal. So this is very important. This is not a rookie job. This is somebody that is really good at accounting and finance. Now, she has no I. She has a very high S and a very high C. She's like a machine. She has no D and no I. She doesn't want to talk to anybody, and she's not going to go to war for me. Okay? Communications. We've talked about the importance of communications. Technology. You can have the best people in the world. If you do not have good systems to support them, you cannot run a world-class organization. Okay? Now, in the 80s, when people, they started bringing computers and technology to the, in, to the country, many people in food service were immigrants, new Americans. Many of them couldn't read or write. We actually had to teach them. They couldn't even clock in to get paid, right? They didn't know how to do that. So different stages of technology, you've got to be sensitive to who are the people around you that you're working with and can they use it. And then strategic relationships. This is the low-hanging fruit. Okay? If you really can build a great organization, people are going to want to partner with you. Okay? It's not hard. This is, not, this is a fun, this is really, building an organization I think is tremendously fun. Okay, how did you hear about this grant opportunity and then attachments? Okay, most, most grants are going to ask you to include your 501c3, your organizational budget. Now, they may require the budget for 2018-19, and they might require the last two years. Most of the time, they're going to ask to see three years. They want to see if you're good at financial management and if you're good at budgeting. They want to know who's on your board. They want to see your conflict of interest policy. Now. Just because you have a policy does not mean your organization does not have conflicts of interest. I know of an organization in town that puts their conflict of interest policy everywhere, and they hire all relatives. <laughs> okay? It's just, it doesn't look good, right? It doesn't look good. <laughs> Top five names and the titles of the highest paid staff. Okay? This is a big one. You'd be shocked at what some organizations pay. Okay? They pay their top five very well, and they pay everybody else a minimum wage with no benefits. And then they want to see your discrimination policy. We're almost done. I'll get you out of here before you all fall asleep. So this is, this is not a complete 990. A 990 is a lot of pages long, but this is the 990 for Sisters of Charity. Since it's the largest endowment in the state, I thought you should just take a look, okay? And this is just a review. So their expenses were $17 million, and they had net income, so excess revenue, of $1.6 million. Six. Um, they only had, now remember, their money, how did they get their money? They sold all their hospitals to private organizations, to for-profit organizations. So they got a big pile of money. When God drops a big pile of money at your feet, 
put it in an annuity, a family foundation, because otherwise it's going to just tr trickle away. It's like people that win the lottery, within two years that money is gone. Okay? You protect yourself by putting it in an annuity, or they did, they put it in a foundation. Um, their program services, they spent $14 million last year, or 2015. Now understand, if, you're, if I have $100 million, um, the rule of thumb is I'm only going to give away about 6% of, of my revenue per year. Okay? Because I want that. Now, you all know Benjamin Franklin, right? He started an, a, an endowment, a foundation in Philadelphia, I think in the 1700s. It still exists today. It's worth millions of dollars. The goal behind a foundation or an endowment is to let that money cook. So you don't want to touch the corpus. You're only going to give away interest or dividend income. And you're only going to give away 6% of it. Okay? So they made a $609,000 in investment income. They didn't rate any bonds. They don't have any royalties. It looks like they sold some property. They don't do fundraising. They just live off. They're just managing their endowment. And they had other revenue of almost $4 million. So since this is the biggest fish in the sea, I just want you to understand and reach out, because you're going to reach out to them. Now, interestingly enough, their executive compensation is $5.5 million. They don't pay for professional fundraisers. So their total compensation is almost 50% of the organization. Now, me, as a financial person, that's high. Typically, in a for-profit business, you never want to see total compensation above 30%. So to me, what shocked me, this was a little high. In 2015, their assets were $91 million. I just went to a meeting with the CEO. They're up to $110 million. Their liabilities are $68 million, and their net assets are $22. Now, I could do a whole class just on these two numbers right here, but we're not going to do that. Charity. <laughs> and the charity has assets that they're still giving away. So now the company's done, but the charity still exists, which is why you use an endowment or foundation structure. So you can apply to them throughout the year. It's a rolling deadline, and the amount that they'll give you varies. So it depends on how good your presentation is. Project Learning Tree, Greenworks Grants, that's exactly the one you need to go to because that's exactly for you. It ended September 30th, so get ready for next year, and you can get a grant of $1,000. The Sam J. Franchino Foundation, October 15th, you can get 1000 Cliff Bar Family Foundation, October 1st, 7000 That also will apply to um, your grant, the Greenway grant. The Serdna Foundation, it rolls. You need a letter of interest. It varies how much they'll give you. And the Lawrence Foundation is due November 1st, and they'll give up to $5,000. Just understand, this is what they print. What I've learned is that if you get into the organization, they love what you're doing, they'll give you more. Okay, that's what they print. Does that help? Everybody got those down? Now, when I first got to my job, my second job, um, there's only five people in our office, they're all women, and nobody wanted to talk to homeless. But I was walking two blocks and running into homeless people everywhere. Is this not me, is it? No, thank God. So I said, well, I'm really good at Excel. I'm just going to start. Well, actually, I started on Google Sheets. You know what I found with Google Sheets? I collect so much data on Google Sheets that I, I can't use them anymore. They, when you get too much data, it shuts off. And you have to go to the history file to pull your data out. So I've had to really switch to Excel again. So what do I do? So yesterday, I am the intake. I'm a grant writer. And not officially, but me and another woman in the organization, she deals with homeless as well. She knows when a homeless person comes in, I need 20 minutes to meet with them. Does my boss know about that? My one boss does, but the big boss, no, we don't tell her. Because she tells me, just write grants. But I can't write good grants if I can't talk to homeless, right. right? Okay. So what date did I meet you? Where did I meet you? Did I meet you on Carta? Did I meet you on King Street? Did you come to the Senior Center? Are you homeless? Or are you sleeping in your vehicle? Are you disabled? Are you malnourished? Do you have medical issues? Almost everyone I deal with, not 100%, but almost, has done 10 years of alcoholism, 10 years of drugs, and they all have cancer. That's the one thing I can say about These are mostly men. I do have one woman who's 64 on crack and still having sex for crack. 64 years old. So, I mean, it's what you learn is shocking. 
Are you receiving Social Security? Are you receiving Social Security disability insurance? Now, what's the rent in Charleston? $1,000 a month? $1,400 a month? The highest I've seen is $780 a month that they receive. That's the highest I've seen. And that's how you end up on the street. Okay. To get disability insurance through Social Security, you're automatically declined the first time. It's a racket. You have to hire an attorney, and the second time you'll get approved. Okay? So that's, that's one of those government subsidy system, um, programs for attorneys who don't really need it. Okay, what was the last date of work you did work? What was your life's work? I have yet to meet somebody who has not worked 30 years. Health insurance, do you have any kind of insurance? What hospital do you go to? Now, we have something in South Carolina called the indigent law, which means you're supposed to take care of all indigents. The reality is most of the homeless go, they're only allowed to see PAs, physician's assistants. Um, I had one gentleman who actually passed in February that they were giving him saline solutions. He had three cancers that had metastasized. Um, I didn't know it was a saline solution, but we had a medical guy on staff. He said, that's just saline. He thought that he was giving himself treatment for his cancer. It was saline just to get him out of the hospital. We did get him into hospice, so he had been homeless, but he did end his days actually in a hospice bed. Um, do they need vision, dental, and hearing? I'm going to be straight with all of you. When I first started working with Meals on Wheels, I thought I had been sent to the third world. Nobody has their teeth down here. Dental is extremely expensive. It's twice as expensive to go to the dentist here as it is in Cleveland, Ohio, and I don't know why. Um, most of our people, if they have nine teeth, we're doing good. Okay? So um, I, I'm very upset at the dental community. Right now downtown, we don't have anybody that will do free dentistry. Uh, there is Echo out in Mount Pleasant, which is a phenomenal nonprofit. I highly recommend you guys reach those people. That woman runs a great nonprofit. Um, but they only do it for Mount Pleasant. I need somebody that's willing to help me downtown. Um, have they been bullied? In fact, I missed one. I had a 42-year-old homeless woman um, who, when anybody finds out she works, she gets raped on her way home. And I, I met her right, right in front of Layla's Lebanese restaurant one morning before she was washed, going to wash dishes, and she cried and told the beautiful young woman, and she cried, she goes, you know, if they think I've forgotten a check, they rape me. And, I mean, it's, you know, she has lives in a tent. It's very hard. So have you been bullied? Have you been raped? Have you been in hospice already? What was the reason for referral? Do you get any church assistance? The reality is churches do not like to work with the homeless. They like what I am told. Denise, we like to protect our congregations. Okay, now this is data points that I'm collecting, and I'm not a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Call her, now, if somebody calls in and says, my brother's homeless, I need help. My mother is homeless. I'm in the hospital. I have a 38-year-old daughter at home that can't take care of her. I'm out of food. I need money to get my prescription. We need, yesterday we gave money, $2 to somebody to get on the bus, okay? So who's calling? What's their number? Why are they referring? What's the age of the person in need? Are they a veteran? What's their relationship? Phone number, email, okay? So that all this data I'm collecting. So I told Sisters of Charity about all of this. Zip code, thank you for coming. Do they have a storage locker? Are they living in a vehicle? Are they living on the street? Do you go to a hurricane shelter? Well, guess what? You can't go to a hurricane shelter unless you have a utility bill. So guess what? If you're homeless, there ain't no utility shelter for it, a hurricane shelter. Did you go someplace where it went got below 32 degrees? Well, there's one church in Mount Pleasant that will pick up people on the street. Otherwise, you spend 32, you spend it outside. Okay? Did you call for an emergency food box? We will give emergency food, 30 days. However, we used to give 40 pounds of food a month. We had to get down to 10 pounds of food because we were running out of food so much. Okay? So sometimes, so sometimes you may have to go to multiple food pantries just to get through the month. Medical issues, this is what I've encountered. Prostate cancer, bone cancer, TIA, those are little tiny strokes. They're legally blind. Actually, my legally blind homeless man, four-year college degree from College of Charleston, and played basketball all four years here, and was voted the number in the top 75 basketball players in the United States. He's homeless from his blindness. His blindness. I had a gentleman, VA, broken neck, amputee, diabetic, and my 20-year-old with the gunshot. Okay, now, 
When I shared all of this with the sisters, yes. So we just have a few more minutes. Yeah, Sorry, it's over. Okay. I think there's two slides left. Okay. Um, when I shared all this information with Sisters of Charities, they sent us a check and they said, please add the following educational attainment. High school, GED, certificate, community college, bachelor's, master's, and PhD. This is telling the story. So I met, so I leave the college and I walk over to Meals on Wheels. And I talk to the homeless people that are sitting on the street. So I met Kenny sitting uh, in a wheelchair. I introduced myself. I handed him a little card that has our information about emergency food boxes. Um, and I told him we can take people, even though it's a senior center, we can take care of people of all ages. It usually takes a couple of conversations before the homeless will even trust you enough to come to the center. Okay. Kenny worked as a construction laborer for 30 years for cash. So who should be in jail? Kenny, the homeless guy, or the man that ran the construction company and paid his employees cash? That man, right? December 23rd, he had experienced severe stomach pain, was rushed to the emergency room. They re re he was very lucky because most people die from stomach aneurysms, but they, they operated on his aneurysm. He threw a blood clot. Now, I've never heard of people throwing blood clots from surgery for Cleveland. I apologize, but we have the Cleveland Clinic up there. My boss lost her husband to this. The, there's a man across. I mean, I know more people that have near-death experiences down here for blood clots. There's something they're not doing right. I've never heard of this before. So he leaves, So they cut his leg off from below the knee. He leaves the hospital in a wheelchair. Hospital's done. Okay, no savings or disability insurance. First, he lost his apartment. And then his car was repossessed. And then Kenny was on King Street. He had been on the street for three months when I met him. Kenny did have a cell phone. I provided him a list of people and service organizations, sorry about that, to call and checked in with him daily. After three months of dogged determination on his part, he called each person three to four times a day. Kenny was off the street. And this was the last message that I received from him. Okay, now these are Kenny's words. This is Kenny in the wheelchair. Thanks for your help. I got back in the shelter a couple of weeks ago. Vocational rehabilitation, which is through the state, is working on getting me a high activity leg. It has to be approved by their home office in Columbia. These are his words. I will know something in a week or so. Then they will help me find a job after. I really like to thank you for your help. You didn't have to help me, but thanks. It takes time, but I think it'll work out. Thanks, Kenneth. Okay, so that story, his words, went in the grant application. Okay, so I was going to end with the Pointer Sisters. I'm so excited. Okay. I just can't hide it. Okay, so that's the Pointer Sisters. All right. So this is all attainable. It's not just about the grant. You have to build the world class organization. And it takes time, but now you know what the seeds look like. Okay?